Greeting kings, greeting queens. Welcome to another edition of Mental Roller Deck. Baba, what is the topic today? It's called What They Never Told You About Slavery. To everyone that's participating, feel free to actually go ahead and send your questions. Um, what you, for me, ignorance is a lack of information. And when you like information, you can always go and get it. And I'm going to lead with that, basically. Um, a welcome today, a new brother on the platform, W. Gabriel Selassie. I. Hi. 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 Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Glad to be yeah. here. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> you welcome, 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 brother. Hey. Positive energy and, to you. Want to go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself, sir? Uh, I am a professor of African American history and U.S. history at Los Angeles City College. I teach a graduate course um, in uh, civil rights, um, and I graduated from an HBCU, Prairie View A&M University of Texas. So shout out to my HBCU brothers and sisters, love. And nice. I'm just here to hope to, to gain some knowledge and see if we can commiserate on this idea of what is missing in our knowledge about the slave trade and slavery in general. Nice. nice. <clears throat> Baba. Welcome. Go ahead and welcome, brother. Welcome. I, I just want to welcome the new brother, too, while I got a chance. Thank you. Thank you. We, we thank you for gracing our platform and the Queens, as usual, and uh, Brother Baba. And uh, I yield. Baba, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, King. Uh, my name is, my corporate name was Alvin Bagley. When I, when I, you know, then later on, after I went through a few initiations, my name was changed to Kahan Yashibaya. That's, that's my pen name that I wrote under. But I, I'm a Baba Lao out of the ancient sacred science of my ancestors called Ifa. And uh, I'm, I'm an ordained uh, bishop. I was as ordained as a bishop. I have a doctorate degree in theology. That I obtained, and uh, I pastored 48 years of the church there in Texas, in a place called uh, Athens, Texas. I'm originally from Mesa, Arizona, raised in Carson County, Texas. Attended oh. a black, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, attended a black, uh, all black uh, school there called G.W. Jackson in Carson County. Won state champ five times back to back. I was all district quarterback. Attended college at Navarro College. I am from what they call Texas. You know, and uh, lived around Dallas a many number of years, and I got involved in this thing in this movement under Dr. Rav, under Dr. Rav David Abernathy. I'm a member of the SCLC chapter out of Dallas, Texas. I marched with Dr. Albert Abernathy before he transitioned. I uh, studied under Dr. Barry Shango, under Dr. Uh, 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 Doc Ben, uh, Ivan, Ivan Ben Sertiman, who wrote the book that came for Columbus. He named me Amaliki, Amalekia. So that was my initiate name. And then from there on, I've been doing a lot of studying on my own and researching on my own. So I don't call myself no great not, uh, man of knowledge, but I just share what I know and you can accept it or reject it. All I say, don't believe nothing. I say, do the research. You know, that's how I got started. And that's why I stand. Because a lot of things we've been told has been misinformation, even by some of our own so-called scholars. And I ran into some things because a lot of things I've been hearing uh, was not quite right. When I went back and checked the record and read it for myself and did the et and did the etymology of the word and chronology and the timeline, it just didn't fit the mold. So I was prompted by the ancestors to write the book called The Other Side of Slavery, The Untold Story. And it said the good, the bad, and the ugly. It is, a, it, it is a compilation of work that I've gathered and some of my commentaries from lectures that I've done. So when you read the book, it's in a question and answer platform, but also it has a lot of data in it. So that's how I got the book out there. And I've noticed sometimes people look at it and say, well, that's not quite correct. Well, I, I, that may be, but I have my documents and I'll, you can check the documents and see if they're correct or not. So, uh, I would like to say the reason why I came to this, I was a, I was a, I was becoming a member of a group called In Cobra. Uh, Doctor Celeste, you might have heard of a group called called In Cobra. 
No, I don't think so. Can you, can you just give me this brief background real quick? Hey, hold on yeah. for a second. Hold on for a second, guys. Hey, Rich, do me a solid. There's, there's seven people here. I'm going to step out of the background. So um, I'm going to need you to lead the charge. All right. Okay, I'm here. All right, got you. I'm, I'm going to put myself in the background so everybody can be up on the platform. All right. You can go, yeah, I can continue. Uh, in Cobra was a group that's organized back uh, in around 1989, and it, it came out of a out of a thing when the black when our people were looking for reparation, and they organized a group called In Cobra. At that time, uh, John Connolly, John Connie Kanye had uh, filed for a a study of reparation called HR 40. Mm -hmm. And like many of our people, I went out to try to find this reparation. And man, I went went to do my research and going and going and going. And in my traveling, I, I, I ran into a situation. I went, I went to a place called Natchez, Mississippi. Yeah. Sure. I was invited to go there. And and really I went there because I was talking to a white individual. And he asked me, had I ever heard of this young man by the name of William Johnson, William Natchez Johnson, the barber. Oh, sure. the, the, the one of the richest men in, in uh, the South, black man. That's right. Well, when I went there to his house, there on at 201 State Street, mm -hmm. I had a chance to get his diary. Oh. I app actually has his diary. And as I read his diary, I found out that he owned at close to 2,000 acres of land and he owned slaves. Mm -hmm. At that time, it, it bothered me. I say, here's a black man who came out of slavery and he's only slaves. Something ain't clicking. Well, the more I researched, the more I found out that you had more and more blacks in the South that owned slaves. Yeah. Then I found out that we had some blacks who also owned white slaves. And that blew me away. So I well, had I'm not really sure about the white slaves part, but yeah, he, you're in fact, yeah, he was one of the wealthiest slave owners in America. Well, he he was one of right because that was, as I went along. Uh, can I call you a doctor, uh, Dr. Gabriel, yeah. Gabriel? Gabriel, yeah, Gabriel. As I went along, I found more and more that uh, that was rich, and I ran across a young lady. She owned a plantation in Natchitoches. Her name was Maria to uh, Teresa Corn Corn. She owned three hundred. She owned eleven thousand acres of land, and she had three hundred slaves that she owned. It. She had the largest African-American plantation in America, owned by a sister. And I said, whoa. And as I traveled a little bit more, I found out about a few other people who owned slaves. Then I ran across a guy by the name of J.A. Rogers. Have you, do you, have you heard about, any y'all know a guy by the name of black uh, historian named J.A. Rogers? J.A. Rogers, no, inform us. It's about Joel Augustus Rogers? Yep. Yep, sure. Dr. Rogers. So he wrote a book called Africa's Gift to America. You're familiar with it, Gabriel? Excuse me, say that again? Are you, are you familiar with his book, uh, Africa's Gift to America? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's a somewhat well-known book. Yeah. So in his book, he prayed for the fact that on page 62, he said that he quoted and it said that that white people were bought in Virginia as far back as 1640. They came in and blacks was buying them as boy as 1640. Blacks was owning white servants or white slaves. They were Christians, and he quoted in his book. And I happen to have a copy before me called Africa's 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro. Well, well, I think we're going through the introductions, but I, I'd like to contest that statement that you made about white slaves, but we can get there at, at some point. Well, I mean, you know, well, well, let me lay it out. And then you want to contest it? Then uh, I'm here because I'm, I'm here to learn. Wait, to but learn. no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. But let me just say this to the panel and the people on board: we we love your energy, and we're glad you came here. And it's going to be more people coming in and out, like Jermaine said. It's only can six to fit on the panel, so we're going to allow Baba to do his introduction, and then I'm going to direct others uh, to to add in. I mean, you you can't interrupt at the time. Anybody can, as long as you see he's finished his point. And then, uh, but basically I'm gonna lead people in and out until uh, Jermaine comes in because he has a lot of information and uh, the people that's listening, uh, 
uh, we, you know, we just gonna have to go with the flow with Baba and then Baba, you let us know when you want to take a break, you know, or pause. So, so uh, Gabriel can come in or, or, or uh, Adiz or anyone else. Uh, what so I would like to, but, but thank you. What I would like to do is I would like to do this in three phases. Vince, I, I was asked to come on and talk about it. I want to do this before Civil War, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War. Okay, but in your introduction, you're, you're laying down uh, the, the things that we wasn't taught. Um, in right. School. Uh, okay, you're laying down the history now. Um, so let so me. You lay, wait, wait, one second, Baba. Once you lay down the once you lay down the introduction, are you are you are you, you going to go into uh, pre -war, uh, Civil War or after Civil War? How are you going to do that? We're going we're going we're going back to where where well every black person go and that's they go to, they said slavery was 1619. Okay. And my question is this: When did the first black man arrive on this continent called the New World? Okay, was it that okay. Because we start our history, we keep starting our history at slavery, and we are much older, and we've been around much longer. So I will, I, I had, I had a problem with that because slavery was a condition. That's not a people. That was a condition. So to start my history in 1619 as a slave, and I'm in my search, I found out that was not quite correct. Oh, I see. Okay. And my, so, issue with, my issue with that was that many things we was taught and told to do, we never saw the other side of it that uh, that uh, was presented to us. And a lot of them didn't ever investigate. We took it at face value. Well, in my travel and my traveling, I found out a lot of this was not true. Okay. And I, I can only speak for myself. I never heard of, uh, of most of the things you already mentioned and learned that in history class and in school. And uh, even in college, uh, I mean, I went to music school, so I really didn't go to a college in research and in black history. But during my school years, I never heard of it. I can't speak for the others. And uh, does anybody else on the panel, I'll start with you, Gabriel, that want to um, uh, mention anything about the introduction or, or ask about by any questions? Well, there's just a couple of things that I just like to comment at this particular point. One is that I think that there is a great misnomer, and you hear this particularly a lot from uh, people who espouse Southern rhetoric, Southern, um, or I wouldn't say white supremacy because that's not quite it, but those people who back Confederate history, you'll hear this quite a bit. And they'll always talk about the idea that whites were enslaved just as much as black people were enslaved. And I think that that's a great m misunderstanding. There were white people in British North America who were indentured, who were forced at a, for a, usually the time period was about five years to work alongside slaves. Um, and they were oftentimes mistreated just as much as African slaves, but they should in no way be considered to be slaves because after their period of indenture, they would be freed. So the, the, the big separation between the two is one of hope, right? You know at some particular time period that this is all gonna end, whereas people from Africa, people of African descent, our ancestors would, could, even if they were indentured, would always have the idea hanging over them that they could be indentured for life. Something that happened to like John Punch, right? Who escaped with two other indentured servants the two white indentured servants, once they were captured, they were given a number of years added, but John Punch was enslaved for life. The, the second thing here is, is that I think what Baba does mention, which is absolutely true, and every time I hear this, it just really burns me. Every time we talk about slavery, we always begin, or even black people on the continent, we always begin at 1619. And that is an absolute fabrication. It's a simple trope. The, the, the year 1619 is easy for people to kind of get their minds around because that is when the time a ship landed off the coast of uh, Jamestown and black slaves were brought on, Christianized, and then turned into ind indentured servants. Anthony Johnson, if you've probably heard of him, was yes. one of those indentured 
slaves that became an indentured servants who then went on to own slaves. So we use 1619, but that is a complete fabrication because there were people, for example, a man by the name of Estevacchio, who we call Little Stephen, mm -hmm. who was in the Americas um, at least 100 years before um, the date 1619. Um, some people call him the first great African man in the New World, right? So why the date 1619 just keeps resonating and keeps getting perpetuated, I'm not really too sure why that is. Um, but it is there. And I think Bob is absolutely fundamentally right about that. And I, and I thought that to be very interesting because there is documentation of, of King Charles sending um, mandates over to the slaves in 1660 to convert the slaves to Christianity. So, yeah. Yeah. It just, it, it just, this one particular incident, right? You guys know about this incident where I'm speaking of, right? Where, where a ship, a Dutch ship is, park off the coast of Jamestown. Yeah. Everyone's starving aboard the ship. They trade food for, uh, I think it's the number is 16 some odd Negroes. Yeah, and, 20, 20 Africans. Yeah, 20 Africans. And then that's the, the nexus of where black people are in the North American continent. And oh, for whatever cool. reason, people just seem to latch on it. It's sort of like latching on to Juneteenth, right? <laughs> and, and black Emancipation Day, which it's ridiculous. But black okay. people have that in their minds. Okay, I have a question for Baba first, and then you can go, Gabriel, or any of the ladies can jump in. Why would you guys think, we already know that they took this out of history, because it's already, I can speak for myself, I never heard of, of, of what you guys already said in school. Um, is there any theory or an assumption you guys may have that may be closer to the truth than not, why this 1690 date is so stamped? I'd have to agree with uh, Gabriel. They, it was just something they could lock their mind up. But see, a lot of people forget the fact, uh, and this is not now, uh, uh, there was a ship called Jesus of, 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 of Lundbuck, captain by Sir, John, Sir, uh, Sir uh, uh, Hawkins, uh, a ship that was commissioned to bring, he was a slave trader. And that was back in 1555. Mm. They don't talk about that. He a team called... Later we call it Sweet Jesus. It was called Jesus of Lug of Lugbuck. Look him up. It was a ship captained by, by John Hawkins, Sir Sir John Hawkins, Captain John Hawkins. And it's and it says they brought slaves in in 1555, but nobody talks about that. But everybody wanna lock in on this uh 1619. And as you know, when we study this thing, look at if 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 from six from uh 1619 up to what was it? uh for 86 years blacks was owning and purchasing slaves and etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm jumping ahead of myself because i was, was going to do it a little bit different but since we there uh i would like to come from roger's book and then i want to bring some other information in uh okay. and uh to solidify what i'm saying because my thing is documentation beats conversation and allow me to let my queen uh, read from Rogers' book, uh, 100, 100 Amazing Facts of the Negro, start with 63 and 64, and a other couple of passages, and y'all can make notes. Then I want, then I'll, then I'll bring a few other things in because I understand and I appreciate it, and I'm glad we got Gabriel on here because we can, we got different points, and, and I must appreciate your, 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 your knowledge and your time in the field, you know, uh, and this, and it's going to be good for all of us. We all going to learn something. Mom, will you read from J.A. Rogers' book, 100 Amazing Facts? Okay, okay, one second. What we, what we like to do okay. is, Gabriel, I want to hear your assumption on why 1619 is so stamped there. And then after you give your answer, we're going to give Baba the floor so he can flow and, 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 and talk to the people. Well, I, I think there's something about human beings where we need to put things in nice, easy boxes, right? And I think the problem with slavery is that there's no easy box to put it in. No. Um, so part of this is the fact that we look for milestones in history, dates. You know, historians work by dates. And if you can't sort of historicize and figure out what the exact times were, you have interesting narrative, but you don't have history. So this ship landing off the coast in Jamestown 
1619 is really convenient because it, 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 it marks a real significant point of departure. One of the things that happens to these 20 Africans that are put on board is that one of them eventually becomes a somewhat well-known slave owner. His name is Anthony Johnson. Right. He's listed in the roles in Jamestown as Anthony the Negro. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy for historians to kind of, you know, look at the, the Jamestown registry. And, you know, it's quite interesting is that when they couldn't figure out, you know, uh, people's last names, they would just put, you know, Anthony the Negro or like there's there were Armenians in Jamestown and they just put, you know, Jim the Armenian. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think historians just tended to see this event. They knew who Anthony Johnson was. He's listed in the court date because he's involved in a number of lawsuits with his neighbors and his business partners, and they just latched onto it. it, it it's a, Anthony Johnson's story is a riveting, fascinating story, and it's, it just allows for this compelling 1619 narrative, right? So um, uh, Mustafa Azamori, who this um, little Stephen was basically brought to the continent around 1527. So why historians don't lack, think about, well, you're here in 1527, that's 100 years before 1619. Why doesn't that give you pause to, to, to reevaluate things? And why, it just doesn't fit in the narrative, right? For one, Estevacchio technically, even though he was from Africa, he was captured and brought to the new world by Spaniards. Mm -hmm. So African African-Americans are, British oriented, right? Because we were brought first by the Brits, theoretically speaking. And so our orientation is always towards England and the United States and not towards say Spain, even though Estevacchio was in North America, right? Okay. Right. All right. These, these All are right. I mean, great. some of the problems with that. Yeah, I mean, great points. Okay, Baba, we're gonna give you the floor and let you do your thing. And, um, and you let us know, Baba, when you wanna open up for a Q and A or, and uh, I want you to, 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 to lay your to lay your information now. Uh, well, allow me to uh, go on the journey that I went on to get where I am to, to, with the information that I came up with and why it had me to start thinking and challenging some things. And I can appreciate uh, Gabriel's uh, presentation because we can go back further than that. As you know, I've got I have a YouTube video out that goes back 2.5 billion years of Negro history. Now, I don't like you with African American because. There was no land called African American land, and it was coined, uh, popularized in 1988 when Jesse Jackson ran for president, and I was a delegate out of the Texas uh, chapter uh, to work on his on his campaign. But so I like to use the word Negro because there are many laws says Negroes, this Negroes, that, and and then that is a land mass, a land you could. Uh, there's the Rio Negro River in South America, where there was a tribe of people of color live about oh. 70,000, 80,000 years ago, the record show that came up that was called the Akan people. Then later on, you have what's called the Aztecs, the Mesoamericas. Uh, uh, one writer wrote a book called uh, Black Discovery of America by Michael Bradley. And then another brother, Horace Butler, wrote a book about when rocks cry out. But let me go on this journey. What got me on this? And then, you know, we can just uh, fill along. Mom, will you read from J.A. Rogers' book, 100 Amazing Facts About the Nigger? This is what got my attention. Because I, I, I followed Jay and, and a few other writers. The, uh, come on, Mom. Under slavery, number six to three, the word slave was originally applied to white people. It comes from Slav, a Russian people captured by the Germans. 64 says, the first slaves held in the United States were not black, but white. They were Europeans, mostly British, who died like flies on the slave ships across. On one voyage, 1,100 perished out of the 1,500. At another time, 350 out of 400. In Virginia, white servitude was for a limited period, but was sometimes extended to life. In the West Indies, particularly in the case of the Irish, it was for life. White people were sold in the United States up to 1826, 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Andrew Johnson, president of the United States, was a runaway 
and was advertised for in the newspapers. That came from Roger's book, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro. He got me started looking at things and I ran across another particular work. Uh, I, I think I, I shared it with you, King. It was talking about the slave code, Virginia slave code of, sev, of 1705. The, the Virginia slave code of 1705. I'm doing this to, to back up a point that there were laws passed uh, in Virginia forbidding Negroes from buying Christian, Christian whites for slaves. I got to get the book. Uh, but it's called the, the Virginia Slave Code. Uh, Shanae, do any of y'all happen to have that? Shania, any of y'all happen to have that particular work? I have I have it here, Baba. Okay. Uh, from the This came from the Virginia Records. Would you read what you have there? And I'm going to get Roger's book and show what he got it from. This is, this is not some writer. This is recorded in the records there in the Virginia S Slave Code. Would you read what you have? Okay, which page? Where am I? Where am I reading from? Well, I think it's like with page or that four. Uh, what is it? Uh, four with that four. Uh, ninety eight. No, four forty eight. Is it four forty eight or four fifty? Four forty eight and four fifty. Okay, starting at page four four forty eight. We're be... shipped. Ready? We're shipped. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay. In order to transportation higher shall be accounted and be slaves, and such be here brought and sold, notwithstanding a conversion to Christianity afterwards, and be it be enacted by the authority aforesaid, and it is hereby enacted that if any person or persons shall hereafter import into the colony into this colony and here sell a slave and a, any person or persons that shall have been a free man in any Christian county or country, island or plantation, such importer or seller or aforesaid shall forfeit and pay to the party from whom the said freeman shall recover recover his freedom. Double the sum for which the said freeman was sold to be recovered in a court or record within the colony according to the course of the common law, wherein the def defendant shall be admitted to plead and bar any act or statute for limitation of action. Continue. Mm -hmm. Continue. Continue. Provided always that slaves being in England shall be sufficient to discharge him of his slavery without other proof of his being manumitted there. Great. And also be enacted by the authority aforesaid and in the hereby enacted that all masters and owners of servants shall find and provide for their servants. Keep going. Wholesome Keep going. Okay. Yes. Wholesome and competent diet, clothing, and lodging by the discretion of the county court, and shall not at any time give a immoderate correction, neither shall at any time whip a Christian white servant naked without in, without an order from a justice of the peace. Continue. And if any notwithstanding this act shall presume to whip a Christian white servant naked without such order the person so offering shall forfeit and pay for the same for shillings sterling to the party injured to be recovered with costs upon petition without the formal process of inaction as in by the act and provided for servants compliments to be heard provided complaint be made with the six months after whipping Keep going. And also enacted by the authority aforesaid, aforesaid, and it is hereby enacted that all servants not be enslaved, whether imported or become servants of their own accord here and bound by any court, church warders shall their complaints received by justice of the peace 
who if he find cause shall. Continue. All right. Find the master over to answer the complaint at court, and it should be determined. Roman numeral 10. I'm at page 449. Okay. Roman numeral 10 goes down to say, and be it also enacted that all servants, where, whether by importation, indenture, or hire here, as well as FEM, converts, and others shall in like manner, as in providing upon complaints of misusage, have their petitions received in court and their wages and freedom without the formal process of inaction and proceeding and, and judgment shall in like manner also be had there thereupon. That's okay. 10. Okay. Um, uh, uh, page 450. Would you read that? Okay. Page 450. Mohammedans or other infidels shall at any time purchase any Christian servant. Nor wait, any wait, wait, wait. I want you to go back and go up to um, 11 of uh, four, uh, uh, 40. What is that? That 49 or 48? 449, 11. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. And for further Christian care and usage of all Christian servants, be it also enacted by authority after aforesaid. And it is hereby enacted that no Negroes, mulattoes, or Indians, although Christians, or Jews, or Moors. Continue. All right. Um, this word, Mohemetans, am I uh -huh. pronouncing that correctly? Mohemetans or other infidels shall at any time purchase any Christian servant, nor other except of their own complexion or such as declared slaves by this act. If any Negro, mulatto, Indian, Jew, Moor, Mohemetan, or infidel, or such as are declared slaves by the act, shall notwithstanding purchase any Christian white servant, the said servant shall ipso facto become mm -hmm. free and acquit from any service then due. And shall be held so deemed and taken. Yeah, I just like to stress the point here in the language. There's a distinction they're making between servants and slaves. That should be noted. Okay, but irregardless, they were it. it, it <laughs> beautiful. What we're talking about it says no Negroes, and we we we've been led to believe that. All black folks were owned by white folks and we were slaves. The point I'm making is not according to the Virginia uh, Slave Code of Law of 1705. And if we go back and look from uh, 1619 to 1705, we're talking about 80 some years of activity. So where the 40 years come in at? And not only that, we'll find further and further off in it that even in the Carolinas and et cetera, et cetera, how the thing was enacted and said you should not be in Louisiana Act Code, you can no yeah, longer. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I, I, there is black people in the colonies. If you were a free person in the colonies, you could own slaves. But, you, okay. but there were no white slaves. That's the point that I'm stressing. Well, if see, but in the slave code in 1705, enacted by the Virginia House of Burgesses, they that's specifically true. made the distinction between servants and slaves, and they yeah. write in the code white servants. They never say white slaves and the reason yeah, yeah. for that is is because there were not i got a question a i got a question word. i got a question baba um okay. that i'm gonna ask um what is the difference between servant and slave in order for someone to serve they work for someone right being a slave is also you performing a duty as well you're working for someone correct correct because one of the things that they don't actually indicate is that these slaves are on a contract as well no, that that's no. We have there is a definition for slavery. The, what is the definition? Is, yeah, the definition, the definition of slavery is simple. It's the status or condition of a person um, over whom any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. So there is a distinction that is made that if you're a slave, that your slave master has the right of ownership. 
That is a major distinction. And as an indentured servant, you don't have that distinction of having the right of ownership over a person. What you have is a contract that allows you for a certain period of time to use someone's labor. So for an example, in most cases, a slave could be killed with impunity. Violate a rule, they kill you. There's almost nothing anybody can do against that, no matter how trivial or small your infraction was. However, an indentured servant is killed for an infraction, most likely the law probably will show up and start asking questions. That's a major distinction. Um, well, we, could, we could play and finesse with the word alone, but if you're working for somebody and you're under contract and you're gonna work until a debt is worked off, we do that even now in this day and time. You work for, hoping to get paid at the end of the week. Uh, uh, but we can play with the word slave or, or, or indentured servant, but it mounts to the same because when, when, when Queen read it from the definition from the word Slavic, where it came from the Russian word Slavic, which, which meant slave, no matter how you flip it or trip it, it means that you was indebted to somebody for a period of time based on how they feel and treat you. So no matter how it counted, you got a book, a book was written by, uh, 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 called They Were White and They Were Slaves by Michael Hubbard II. He said the same thing. We can call it servitude, but it's still working for somebody for a period of time. Yeah. So it's like it's yeah, but Bobby, the distinction has to be made. Let's not try to finesse this. Way, Doc, let's not finesse. That's our problem now. We try to finesse words and not break it down. How you define it, fine. But when you are indebted to somebody and they're working your tail off, they have control of your life, your livelihood on a daily basis, call it what you want. It. That to me is slavery. Yeah, sure. But the distinction has to be made because at yeah. your job, the job that you go to, your boss can't just simply rape you, can't just simply kill you. Well, a slave, you know, on the other hand, let me speak, let me speak, please. No matter how you want to put it, people are people to do when you honor other people's rules and guidance, you're not being watched over by the police saying you can't do that. And a lot of things happen to these people in other situations because it even talks about them in a marriage and doing certain things. So let's not get out here in an emotional area and finesse this thing. Let's tell it like it is. We rewind, we can't get reparation because we had a lot of our sisters and brothers who participated in the slave trade economically, like you said earlier about William Natchez Johnson. And as I go along a little further, we'll bring up other names who did the same thing even to their own kind. So we can finesse this. I've been probably want to finesse it and make it clean for, for the other man. Like I mentioned before, let me slow down. I'm, uh, the geach is coming out in me. Uh, let me slow down. We say this, that, and other, but I have documents to show that we had not just Union colored soldiers, you had Negroes fighting in for the, for the South against the North. And I've got no, it. Not, that's not, Bob, that's that? not true. Say what? Let that's me get my documents when I get hey. to that. Get now, hold on for a second. I like to. Okay, wait. Hold on, Rich. Hold on. Uh, um, what I want to say. Um, okay, go ahead. Oh, no, I know I'm, you're I'm in here. Um, okay. What I like, I pay, I pay attention to words okay. and, and I, and, and I um, reflect on a lot of things. Based on a paragraph that Sinead read, right? It also yeah. indicated it also indicated that you you can no longer buy white servants. They have to be of your own color. So why would they actually eliminate the fact that so-called Negroes were actually buying white servants if it wasn't considered slave? Yeah, because you can buy a contract. A, a an indentured has a contract. And that contract, there is what they call consideration. It, it, you it, promised it, to work it, for me for something. You can't have a contract without consideration. You promised to work for me for what? You are going to give me something. And they call this freedom dues. When I'm done with my indentured servants, you owe me something. You owe me seed. You owe me a rifle. You owe me a horse. You owe me land. You are going to pay me something for my labor. And Sleep, if you didn't get it, nothing. Zero. Okay. So, so this 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 is why this this why the, this topic is so important because we have people like like I like my good doctor here. We'll finesse this thing, but when you come down to reality of it on a day to day basis, you go tell somebody in, that's that's already in that situation, whether you call them a slave or indentured servant, doing the same work, going through the same yeah. thing. That's How true. Are you separate them. How Bob, you separate them? Bob, that is true. 
Okay, so let me move. So let's not finesse this thing and make it all pretty. Let's yeah, but, I, but, I mean, but I'm a historian, right? And I get paid, I get paid uh, to be that. Uh, uh, so wait. here, here is the distinction and why this matters to the audience and why you need to pay attention to this. Why, why, why the language matters? Yes, in many cases, indentured servants were treated just as worse, if not more, than slaves. That's why rebellion. You had the British making sure that they were going to separate white indentured servants from black people because yeah. white indentured servants said, look, I'm in toiling in the fields just like you. I'm being whipped just like you. But here's the distinction. <laughs> indentured servant could always take their master to court. And, and the slave them. Too because I got rich. No black person slave. who is a slave, slave has any. Okay, okay, okay. okay guys, wait, wait, time out, time out, time out, guys. Time out, time out, guys. You no, know, like like you said, we welcome you to Metro Roller Deck. So what we're gonna do? Both of you guys are making great points, but uh, but Gabriel, um, your distinction point has been made, and uh, but we would like to do now. Let Baba finish the information, and let's go back if you guys wanna um talk about uh anything said or clarify anything, Gabriel. Oh, fantastic, reach Baba. Okay, yeah. So Baba, with that with that being said, we've set the fact the record that that the, the Virginia Slave Code of 1705 passed laws saying that no Negro or Mohammedans, Moors, Jews, Indians, etc., could any longer buy Christian, by Christian mean whites for servant or slave. Now we can play with all we want to. We've established that. What I want to let people know is that we had many people of Negroes who were benefited and profiting at that time. Our life was to look at a young man by the name of Anthony Dubalock. Will you pull him up? Anthony Dubalock, put, let's pull him up. Can anybody pull him up? I mean, one of you good sisters, like right now, uh, uh, I got Queen doing something else. Go to your computer and pull up this name. Anthony, uh, Anthony uh, Antonio, is it Anthony? Anthony Dubalock. I think it's Antonio King. Okay, well, let's, let's pull him up and let's just well, see about him. Who has Spell it? his last name, Bobble. It's Dubalock. Uh, let me go in here. It's in, I got him a book of slides for down told story. And his, uh, we'd like to say time. We, we got time. We ain't got to rush through this. Uh, <laughs> his name is Dubalock. Sinead, you, you let, me, let me go here. Uh, hey, I don't know if Rich said it already. It's, but, it's, um, it's D U P. Both of you guys are going to have the opportunity to speak. Um, okay. And we're going to grant each other res the respect to pretty much state what we need to state. We don't want it to make it seem like, you know, Brother Selassie is being overwhelmed and so on. We want to give him a fair opportunity to also speak and get his point across because we're balanced. Right. We're, we're balanced. balanced. Platform. Okay. It's, it says, in a okay, the name is uh, A-T-O-N-I-N-E. The last name is D-U-B-U-C-L-E-T. Antoine Dubalock. I would get the queen, but I want somebody else to read it because I know that I'm not making this up. No, yeah. I don't know who Anthony Dubalock is. He was in a Republican treasurer or something to that nature in Louisiana. Okay, and how many slaves did he own, uh, Gabriel? Oh, probably quite a number. <laughs> and what? And, and that was around what, 1860? And and the well, he, died, oh, yeah. he died in like 1887 or something. Yeah, something like that. So there again, my point I'm making is we run around and telling white act like that white folks own all black folks, and that's not true. And we carry this chip and accusing them of all when a lot of our people own a lot of their people. See what I'm saying? Yeah, and, sure. I don't know why and, black people think that black people didn't own black people. I don't know where they get that from. <laughs> but they've been talked that about some of our scholars when they come about reparations. Tell me how in the world you're gonna pay reparations to people when you when you participate in the same program or same business you're gonna uh, as they were doing, and we're gonna say, well, they that and a lot of whites think that we would that they owned us, but a lot of us owned them. Yeah, some of those wealthy slave owners in Louisiana, I would are probably guess if they were black, they probably owned a, at least at minimum a hundred slaves, and yes, they sir. were all they were all involved in the sugar trade. All of Sugar, them. tobacco, yeah. rice, all yeah. of them. Do I bring it up? Okay. Uh, anybody ha have Dubalock? I, I want you to uh, read it for me. 
Mom, come uh, 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 go ahead. I get the queen to read it. In 1860, there were at least six Negroes in Louisiana who owned 65 or more slaves. The largest number, 152 slaves, were owned by the widow C. Richards and her son, P.C. Richards. This is a sister named C. Richards. She owned slaves. Okay, and her son, come on. Yeah, I don't know her. Okay. And her She's in Louisiana as well? Yes, yes. Louisiana, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. And her son, P.C. Richards, who owned a large sugarcane plantation. Yeah. Yeah. Another Negro slave magnet in Louisiana with over a hundred slaves was Antoine Dubalot, a sugar planter whose estate was valued at in eighteen sixty dollars. In sixty was worth two hundred sixty-four thousand dollars. That year the mean worth of southern white men was three thousand nine hundred and seventy-eight dollars. He was he, he his estate was worth two hundred and eighty something thousand, where the average white back then was only worth three thousand dollars. He was he became the treasurer uh, in what uh, eighteen sixty eight, a part of the Louisiana legislative body. He became the, uh, the state treasurer of Louisiana, along with a guy by the by the, by the E.C. Donnie, and the uh, uh, it goes the list goes on. But I want to go to another one. I want to look at his name is William. April Ellis. Have you ever heard of him, uh, Doc? I mean, I mean yes. Huh? Yes. You okay. mean Ellis son? No, yeah, El yeah Ellison, my bad. You yeah. know, William April Ellison, you mm -hmm. know. And he became one of the richest black men in South Carolina. Right now, matter of fact, Henry Gates did a thing on him a few a couple of years ago where this white guy finally bought white was white guy finally bought the plantation and found out that he that a Negro used to own that. It was a, a slave magnet. So yeah, of, Ellison used to be a slave himself. Yeah, I know. Then he wanted to become a slave breed. He began to breed slaves. <laughs> Isn't that so? Yeah. yeah, you know, my thing is different. People, we blame them, but we was a part of the thing, and we were just, just as rude and mean to our people as they were. As other I'm not making no room for the white people. I'm just telling they, they own both black and white slaves back at the time. You call them. Yeah, they're, they're, they're in South Carolina. There had to have been nearly 200 black slave owners, at least. Probably. Really shows that. Yeah, you know, so, but a lot of people don't get this because they don't teach this in the school. You know this yeah. now. They don't teach this. But they get an education that they probably never heard of it. And they are, are you sure? The record speaks for itself. Uh, you ever heard of Henning statues? Uh, I'm sorry. I my computer goes out every every now and then. Henning's statue. Uh, can you explain? He was the one that wrote some of the laws that the Virginia laws and Louisiana laws that was recorded that such just read a while ago. That laws was passed to stop Negroes and Mohammedans and Muslims. Oh, yeah, statues. That, that, okay, uh, you yeah, got it. Yeah. So we're real. So, and my next point I want to move to. Is that we that we both agree that our people used to own uh you call it the servant of slaves, but they was in the business. Oh yeah, no doubt. Okay. okay. And so we can't run around how about get reparation. Then who you gonna pay reparation to when they come they come to your farm? And and and, and this is ironic. Supposing one of your family members was one of those slave magnets, not how, how y'all gonna pay them? Suppose you, you, you one of your members. On black and white slaves. Yeah, and 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 Baba, I think what's an interesting part about what you're you're arguing, particularly those slave owners, black slave owners in Louisiana, which I find to be just fascinating. Most of them didn't consider themselves to be black people, even though they were black. They considered themselves to be better than black folk and better than white folk. Well, we got boozy people in our thing. Come on, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, um, us ghetto Negroes that we got class in among us now. So <laughs> exactly. You know, we got the booze, we know we got the boulets and the and all yeah. this stuff. But these are all they feel what a dark skinned people. Yeah. You know, always fascinating. More, it more, so we run around and complain about about this pale man, and we got our people was just as much as involved on both sides of the spectrum. And we and see a lot of folks think it was. Negroes and white folks in the north fighting against all the white boys on the south, and wasn't no niggas in the in the battle. I've got records to show that we had Negroes carrying that was fighting in the, with, with the with the Confederate and got honored, got got uh, uh, 
they received what they call a honor uh, on the cross of honor valor they weren't they, they weren't throwing they weren't throwing grits at nobody you know well, i'm not so sure about sure about that the record's pretty plain and clear there have been several okay uh let's go to one of the records and let's just see uh uh ready of ready uh the next year. let me let me interject here uh uh guys because uh, you guys are mentioning that black people were just as much involved as slave owners yes and let me see if i got this right um i uh could you guys give me a percentage on that would you say it was 50 50 or no. are you saying no, 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 by no stretch of the imagination probably one percent maybe no no okay okay so, so my, he said two-thirds of all the slave owners in the entire United States, probably one percent. No, it says according to the Dixon Center of uh, Black Slave Owners, published in the Bond Review, Robert M. Groom's friend several example of black slaves, and he said that that we, that two thirds were owned. Two thirds. Let me ask this question, and um, there has to be insurance records with this, is it not? It is. It is. Yeah, uh, but, but that wouldn't necessarily give you the adequate number. Adequate no, numbers. What no, would be no. a better way to find the numbers is through taxes. Taxes, People right? Taxes on property. Yeah, and I would agree. So I, that that's true. Okay. And we ha and I ran across some tax records, census records, and things like that uh, that show these people. And a lot of them had. You, they wouldn't have what they call. They had uh, maybe like French names, stuff like that. You wouldn't. It, it wasn't no Sam, none of them folks. But you look at the name and check out the ethnicity and how they came to be. And I and I've got to be honest, uh, uh, Gabriel. I had a chance to look at one of your videos, mm -hmm. and you have a you got a distant cousin that you ran across that, that wrote a book. Yes, or pack or something. You, you, they wrote a book. I had a chance to look at that. I said, "Wasn't it amazing that this white boy had an African name?" <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll I, I, I can jump back to that in just a minute, but I just want to. I'm not going to that right now. I, I just, people, if you, there's a really good book. It's called Black Slave Owners Free yeah. Slave Masters in South Carolina. Yeah. It's, by a guy, it's written by a guy by the name of Larry Coger, K O G E R, I who has a pretty good handle on the numbers of uh, black slave owners. Uh, uh, a, a king, uh, 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 Jermaine. He's I got him mentioned in my uh, book. Other side Jermaine, of Jermaine, step away for a minute. Okay, he uh, I've got him representing my book, Other Side of Slave Untold Story. And you're definitely right. So I've got I have him, Robert, and a few others writers that wrote about it. Even, even Carter G. Woodson wrote about it. Uh, so uh, black slave masters, you know, in his book, and we all know Carter G. Woodson. And as I went through the line, I picked the different ones as I did my research and did the collective on the works that I've done. Uh, the point that I was making was that that we had a hand in it like the others had in it. It wasn't a one-sided deal. Now, my next point- Okay, so so uh, my question is, and I'm gonna let you go, but I just, I just gotta interject this. And both of you can answer this. Are you, are you guys saying, um, no, let me ask it like this. Does reformation ha does does reparations have a place? Does is it deserved? Is it deserved by the black America? Based on my information, if I be honest, no. Because we we are guilty of some of the same things we're trying to charge somebody else with. Yeah, but then we and how you gonna say reparation? To, to, yeah, how but, you gonna say reparation? I mean, what okay. what scale are you gonna use to dish out what amount of money or, or service? Uh, you know that uh, <laughs> how are they gonna where you come up to, from the to, to uh, plus it's in the Constitution. You can't get it. Fourteenth uh, Amendment, Section Four. No emancipation. You can't charge no state of the United States for debts for insurrection or anything occurred. So until you until you change the Fourteenth Amendment, Section Four, you're not gonna get it. They've been on this thing for 32 years called HR 40, trying to get it, just to get it investigated. When I started on my journey, and I was, I was in my 20s, and I'm 74 years old, and we ain't got there yet. And uh, do you feel the same way, Gabriel? Um, no, I look at it from a little bit different perspective. Um, when I first started looking at slavery, 
the one thing that I really was shot to kind of sort of piece together was that most people kind of think slavery as some kind of a haphazard kind of thing that That's somebody right. got on a ship and went to Africa and gave some beads to somebody and the hundred slaves jumped on the ship and they came to America's and then they sold them somewhere. No, what, what we know emphatically about slavery is that this was a large scale, well run institution. Yes, sir. In this institution itself, all the a large number of the laws in the United States were designed purposely to keep this institution going. And it's still going. Yeah, yeah. so from my perspective, the United States does owe a debt to black people because slavery was fundamentally institutionalized. Now, we can talk about what reparations ends up looking like, whether you give tons of money to HBCUs or you put empowerment zones in the black community, there, there needs to be something to rectify that institutionalization of slavery. Yes, that's my point. And I'm going to I'm going to um, mention this and then I'm going to let Baba finish. Um, so, Baba, um, Gabriel says no and yes, and he explained why. And you said absolutely no. And my my last my last question is before I let you can continue is the people that suffered um do you feel they deserve anything well we could suffer and feel we deserve a lot of things that's true but how are you going to compensate for it and what's going to you because if you're going to base it on what happened in slavery to our people then you got people of your own kind involved because you might owe some slaves some people that were in slavery, money from your people. Enough to forget watching one of the uh, 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 what is that different world where 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 one of the young ladies, what's that girl name, found out that one of our ancestors used to own slaves on the on, wasn't the Cosby the other show that Cosby wrote mm -hmm. on different world and how she, what's what's the young the, the, the world the little bougie girl on there mm -hmm. she found out that they, they and they really scarred up but to find out that they had actually participated in the system of slavery and enslaving our people of not just, and even the Indians had to act in it. And folks don't want to believe that. The Cherokees had to, had to make some of their slave citizens uh, uh, under a treaty. And while they're in Oklahoma, okay. they had to make them citizens. Okay, I'm gonna let you finish with your information, uh, but that's another live right there. Cause I feel anybody suffered deserves to be rectified. Like we have black cops and then we have black people being beat down. So yeah, so we're going like to, I said, I'm not, you know, but the points have been made. So so continue, Bob. Okay, my next point is that I want to try to deal with the fact that it said that there was no black in the Confederate carrying guns and shooting against the uh, against the North. Oh, by the way, today is the 157th anniversary uh, of the Battle of Millican being that was that, that where Negroes were uh, enslaved was allowed to sh or be combat uh, artillerymen and firemen. It happened in, where I am in Toulouse, Louisiana, Madison, Paris, on June the 6th. It happened at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was, it's called the Battle of Millican Bends, and where the Union Colored Soldiers defeated the Confederate, right here where I am today, on June the 6th, 1863. It's called the Battle of Millican Bends. Yeah. 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 And uh, 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 Shay know about it because she came to one of the celebrations. But my point about Blacks, Carrying arms, See, a lot of people say that. Well, it was some, it was some black folks in it was was in the Confederate, but they would run around. They was cooks, dishwashers. They cleaned latrines. They were, they didn't carry no guns. True, many of them on both sides feared if you gave the Negroes guns, they would retaliate. But I have I have one incident. One sniper was said he was out on maneuvers, and he we was fired up on by a black sharpshooter. Would you read that article, please, uh, Queen, baby? As appearing in the August 2nd, 1861 edition of Harper's Weekly, this is a sketch of Private T Truman Head. Truman Head. A lethal human union markman who was known as California Joe. Take your time. A member of the elite marksman of Colonel Hiram Burden, first United States sharpshooters. California Joe engaged in deadly duels with black Confederate sharpshooters. Wait a minute. He was in duel with a deadly what? Confederate 
black sharpshooter. And that nigga wasn't throwing no grits. <laughs> he wasn't throwing no grits, so he was ducking. This man was a sharpshooter. And I'm going to go ahead and finish that. And I got another one that lived about 80 miles from where I am now in a place called Greenwood, Mississippi. His name was Hope Carrier. Have you ever heard about him, a Doc Gabriel? No. His name was Hope Collier. Okay. California Joe won recognition throughout the army for killing at least one of the most troublesome and lethal black snipers during the early stages of the 1862 Peninsula Campaign. Now, he wasn't shooting nobody throwing grits. He said, that this guy was one of the deadliest sharpshooters that the Confederate had. I got another one here. His name is Hope Collier. Read about Hope Collier, a Negro, former slave. 2008 Hall of Fame inductee Hope Collier. Born in 1846 to the Mississippi slave family of Harrison and Dalphine Collier, Hope was one of probably 11 children. Mm -hmm. The Colliers were home a house servants to the prominent and influential Howell Hines family of Hines County. Hines County, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. At a very early age, Hope demonstrated his marksmanship with a rifle. Mm -hmm. He hunted with a 12 gauge shotgun, became an excellent marksman, and could shoot equally well from either shoulder. Mm. While still just 10, Hope shot his first bear. At the outbreak of the wall for Southern independence, that's the Civil Wall, mm -hmm. Holt's master and son left for the wall after giving him his freedom papers and being told he was too young to fight. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He stowed away on a riverboat and joined Company One of the 9th Texas Cavalry. Oh. At Green River Bridge in Tennessee, Collier went from being camp servant to a soldier, mm -hmm. was involved in frequent action and served successfully as a military spy. Okay. Collier served in the Confederacy mm -hmm. until the war ended in 1865. He wasn't passing out grits. <clears throat> the other guy that, his, I got a young man that received the cross of honor for valor from the Confederate. Would you read about him? Give us his name and there's three of them. Give them their name and everything. This is what we run across. Hold on real quick. Hey, Gabriel, if you yes. want to share the link, right, you have to put it in the actual comment section versus the private, the private chat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Us. That's right. That's right. I'm yeah. sorry, my brother. Thank no, you. No, yeah. you're fine. I just wanted to let you know. That's why I copied it and pasted it. Okay. Oh, you already did it? You, you've already I did done it that. for you. Yeah. Yeah, I you. did it for you. Great. All right. Appreciate it. My queen, uh, where y'all at? Because I I'm, I'm need y'all to kick in there now. Let's, 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 let's do this. I'm not <laughs> mom too much. Come on. <laughs> the Southern Cross of Honor Medal was awarded to Confederate veterans. Wait a minute. Say it again. What kind is it? The Southern Cross, Cross of Honor, Honor. Medal uh -huh. was awarded to Confederate veterans. Not Union and not and not cooks. These were people that was in actual battle doing fighting. Read. It was created by the UDC. Mm -hmm. On the application, one would find the names of endorsers who vouched for the veterans service. Caleb Glover is wearing the cross. Mm -hmm. he, wait a minute, hold on. Caleb Glover is right here. That, that dude, that nappy head dude, that's him with the cross. That's him right there. That's, that's him right there. That nappy head dude, that's him. <laughs> Preston Roberts was featured in a newspaper about receiving his medal. That's two of them got the medal. George Matthewson uh -huh. was buried with his cross on his uniform. Wow. Here is the important thing to remember. The Southern Cross of Honor Medal was awarded during the Jim Crow era. They got it at like like we always get our medals late. You know, they they they, they like they just now awarded uh during during Middle they fought at Pearl Harbor. They, they, they named a, a battleship, they made an aircraft carrier after him. He's the first soldier ever have an aircraft carrier named after him. They're going, going to take 50 years to build it, but the, the Navy just already have, what you call it, on endorsed, or what you call it, uh, uh, it, the Dorian Miller, USS Dorian Miller, is going to, and it's going to be an aircraft carrier because he was a cook. Watch this. But when, when they got bombed, he grabbed this big gun on the ship 
and shot down Japanese aircraft uh, planes. And he's being honored. He's being honored with a with a aircraft carrier in his name, Dory Miller. Yeah, but the problem with that is that he got the Navy Cross just a few days after. Yeah, I'm talking about. We, but we, we know some matter. But come on, they, we always got our stuff. So, so, look, so the black he, 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 given he, he, to, he, 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 to him so. way after the Civil yeah, we, War. Well, yeah, we we got our. <laughs> we always get our stuff. Like, you you know, give, I was in the army, brother, and you don't give medals to people after battles are over if they well, serve. I'm, I'm they, saying, you don't do that. At it. No, but not even the Confederacy, as weak as it was as an army, would do something dumb as that. Okay, well, that, that, I think it's your opinion, but okay, I've got a couple of letters here that was uh that was letters that was written uh from different ones in the battle that saw these black so these black and fairy soldiers out there doing uh some shooting i want to uh what, what readers need to do is pick up a book by a historian by the name of kevin Livin, who's written a book called searching for black confederates the yeah. civil war's most persistent myth and kevin studies the civil war he's a pretty good historian and he's debunked this myth solidly. The, well, what, what, the, what, what, civil, the American Battlefield Trust, who is the one group that's responsible for all the Civil War battlefields, both Confederate and the Union, have thoroughly looked at this and they've debunked this Confederate myth. It's it's a myth. There well, were no we, we call it a myth. If you want to, but let's let's read some letters from some of the soldiers that faced it, that faced these cats in battle. If we, you we, want to know what the Confederacy thought of black people, you should. It, it does not matter. We got how they thought about us when I was in the Air Force, but we, I was still there. I was still there. I'm talking about if you want to know what Confederates at the time of the Civil okay. War thought. Same about thing you think about black folks today. You know, we, we can play with that. Remember, we play with emotion somatic. We are talking about people physically involved in a situation with their life on hand. So, so you, I, I asked the reader to you. read Alexander uh, Stevens, the cornerstone speech. Mm -hmm. And you, when you read that speech, you'll know why there were no blacks in the Confederacy, Confederate Army. Just read that. I got a, que I got a question. Um, yeah. Why is it so difficult to enter over and understand that we play a dramatic role in Roll everything you see today, especially from so-called black people? I, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. It's a, it's this. I'm saying, why is it so difficult for so-called blacks to enter over and understand that they played a major yeah. role in everything going on today? You're talking about everything in, in, in America's past? Why is it hard for people to understand that? Yes, because blacks today has a tendency to say that, okay, I was a slave 400 years ago, and half of them that's talking about this have never been in slavery, unless they're talking about chattel slavery, which is going on through corporations now. But I'm saying anything you tell a so-called Negro today is like they aim to debunk it to say, oh, we're not great, or we didn't participate in this, and we didn't participate in that. And it's asinine to me, because if you do records and check, you can find that our hands was in every single thing. Well, I mean, you have to you, you have to be careful, right, about w what you're saying. I'll I'll give you a primary example. There there was, and I and I, right off the top of my head, I can't think of um, the person's name, an African American who attempted to enlist in the Confederate Army, and was unable to, and eventually ended up in the uh, Union Army. Um, now, we know that there probably were one or two black people in the Union and the Confederate Army, just like there were women who fought in the Union Army and in the Confederacy who hid their sexuality. So nobody is crazy enough to think that there wasn't at least one or two black people that were in the Confederacy. What we're trying to do in historicizing this is to say what was the role of black people in the Union Army or in the Confederacy? What's the role? And if you have one or two outliers, that's fine, but you're not gonna have any substantive black people of anywhere so you, in the Confederacy. So you, so you wouldn't so you wouldn't say that because I've I've heard this from white people. So you wouldn't well, say that was, the, there was blacks, there was blacks over 80%, 80% blacks that were actually a part of the Confederate Army. 80%. Right. You said, well, yeah, of course, white people will say that because they're trying to say that we were not slave owners. We were not cruel. Black people loved being slaves. Black people love white people. Black people love the democracy. And that is asinine. It's just not true. But, but again, 
if you really want to know, and this is something that almost nobody reads, nobody reads this because Alexander um, Stevens was a minor figure in his overall stature, both literally and figuratively in the Confederacy. Read the cornerstone speech of Alexander Stevens. He will absolutely tell you what the average Confederate thought of black people. Then, and to top of that, before the Civil War was over, Alexander Stevens had a conversation with General Grant. What did Alexander Stevens ask General Grant? When this is over, would you allow us to re-enslave our black people? Now think about this. If you had 80% of people being in the Confederate army and you're the vice president of the Confederacy and you're gonna take those guns from all those black people and re-enslave them. It just, it's just on its face, it's just ridiculous. But well, King, you, hold on, Baba. Know. But King, let me ask you this, right? Half of the books we are reading from is written by who? White. Black and whites. Oh yeah, that's absolutely true. Oh, okay. Candace, Candace, Owens, to, Candace to, Owens, who hates black people, has written a ton of books. She's okay. written more books. You know, four books. Uh, She's written more than I have. And okay, Candace so, Owens hates black people. Okay, well, so a word that we tend to use on a daily basis is that word black, right? And nobody is a box of crayons. And even that was given to us by so-called whites. But if you look at the entomology of the word, it means bleak's pale or bleach. So it actually applies to them. And that's a status, right? And the status white refers to us, sovereignty. There can be no other race on this planet yeah, well, that's well, so Getting I'm to just, the, getting to the I'm, I'm, making, I'm, making, a, I'm making a I'm making a point. I'm mm -hmm. making a point. So if 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 you're supposedly the slave master and you write these doctrines or you write these books, that's misleading. Of course, I'm going to gravitate to what you're teaching because it's the only thing that I have to read. Correct? Sure. sure. So, so them saying black people don't know how to read doesn't mean they can't reflect words off a page. Because if you get a black law dictionary, it indicates something different. They're speaking two different languages. So you got to understand that these people play with words, right? And right. that's just what it is. And it's deceptive. You get what I'm saying? Well, I, I get what you're saying, but it still belies the fact that just because the person is of African descent, black, African-American, whatever you want to label them, doesn't mean that they are susceptible to the same fallibilities as the Southern lost cause narrative. Candace Owens thinks that uh, black people are essentially fools, right? She said that yesterday on, on a Glenn well, Beck program. So it doesn't matter who's writing it. What you're looking for is the scholarship. How is the scholarship? What are the sources that they're person to use? And here's the thing that I do. I always ask the Confederate backers, right? Because I'm on all these Facebook groups with all these Confederates, and I ask them the same question, and they always whiff on this. They're never able to answer it. Show me one Confederate role, a muster role, right? Because every person in the Union Army was mustered in, put on a role. Every person in the Confederate Army was mustered in, put on a role. You can't show me one single Confederate muster with a black name on it. Not one. Let me interject this. Not one, not a single one. Watch this. Other than my DD-214, when I went into the Air Force and, my, and, and, and when I got out and, and went to go for my other records, they said that all records at that time had been destroyed by a fire. We know that they're known for destroying records. If they want to hide mm. something, they destroy records. Wait, don't, don't start laughing, Doc, because you know I'm telling the truth. If they, you want to get some, you destroy the record. They destroy show records. Me Just show me one. Show me one. I mean, show me one. didn't exist. Show me one DD-214. I got a DD-214. There you go. Show me one Confederate role. One, just one. I'll tell you, you what. You can't do it. You if, can't if, I get you to come, if I get you to come down here in, in 2020 to the Battle of America Bend event, I will have a piece for you. You look no, at you got to show me a, a Confederate muster role. You can take a photograph and you can text it to me. One Confederate role. I've been asking for this from Confederate matters for 15 years, and they have never have been able to produce one. Okay, well, well, we'll let you ride with that, but I want you to come down here. I want to think. I want to show you. I carry you around. You, you, can't give out invitations unless you know that I'm, I'm gonna take it. Well, I'm offering you an invitation. 
Uh, oh, you know I'm gonna take it. And, and I love you come back. I, I like to show some things personally. Uh, okay, uh, okay, gentlemen. Okay, gentlemen. We we uh, you, uh we're not gonna let you sidebar too long. But okay, uh, because what 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 I want to get into is we have two queens on the panel, and um, I'm gonna let you guys side sidebar again. But I want to see if any of the two queens that, that's on have any questions for for yeah, uh, Baba for Baba. Uh, I apologize, Queen. I'm about to step aside to listen to you. No, no, no problem. This is a this is a, this is a passionate uh, subject. Um, I have a question for, I have a question for uh, Baba. Um, with uh, with the history that we know uh, about the Battle of Milliken Bend, and the history that uh, uh, the doc here is not allowing you to say because it is. I've written in the books that he is familiar with, uh, or the documentation that he's familiar with. Um, why is it, uh, how is it, Baba, that this type of information is constantly uh, swept under the rug and not acknowledged? Uh, because I know that you have been at this for quite some time, uh, a whole lot longer than uh, the doc here. Uh, why is it that this information has I'm gone? I'm sorry, Carolyn, I've been studying this for 20 years. Sir, I, 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 I got it, but he's been doing this longer than you. I'm asking a question to Bob. I'm probably older than he is. You are? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, wait, okay, wait, 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 wait a minute, guys. Okay, guys, okay, guys let's, let's not get in the sidebars. Ask, <laughs> okay, okay. Ask, I want questions. Yeah, because I, I'm asking Bob a question. Okay, okay. Let's let's continue. I, I was I was on point. I was on point. So Bob, yeah, yeah, why yeah. is it that this information has gone uh, unnoticed or swept under the rug? I know you've been doing this for a long time. So what is uh, uh, why is it that it's been gone been swept under the rug? And secondly, how is it that we can attain this information properly? Um, you know, so that we can have it you know, for our archives as well. Number one, remember the, the object was to keep it out of sight, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind, keep it swept on the road and keep it out of the history book because we don't control those things that goes in the history books. And a lot of things that would be given, they make sure they don't get into mainstream media. Like a lot of my books that was not able to be printed, they didn't let it get into mainstream, you get to go underground to get it. Unless you knew somebody, they have to have a copy of a manuscript of it, or you knew somebody, knew somebody was involved in it. And get what you call uh, 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 a first hand you know, ear to mouth on it, or you go to these places and you ask questions uh, and you talk to different ones, and then you see where the information is coming from. And so, we know for a long time, in order for these people to act like that they are superior, you got to hide anything that makes them look inferior. And they manage to do so through what books you put in a hide, you put in a book, hide in a book, and they ain't gonna look at it. You know, that's been the old saying. But myself, I went to look for myself. I talked to people, and you can call it debunk, well, but when you talk to people like Hope Collier, Hope Collier lived 84 miles from here, and I went to the museum in Vicksburg. He's in the museum in Vicksburg, and the records are there. Matter of fact, he was a scout for Theodore Roosevelt of the Teddy Bear that came up to Teddy Fest. He was a Negro that led, the, 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 led that. Plus, you got many honorable statues to this Negro for the work he's done uh with the confederate whether we're on a muster or not you know a lot of us are our own worst thing because we fight things rather than look at it and we quote all these other people but have you went yourself personally and checked the record to see if it be so or not i'm not asking you to believe what i'm saying i'm saying do the research don't believe that i'm just saying go do your own research but don't allow that to sway because when i went and had a chance to sit back and enjoy one of uh, uh, uh gabriel's presentation at Prairie View, he was talking about when he did his DNA, 80% sub-Saharan, he said this, some, some aunt or somebody went to Bishop Kyle, well, I know what Bishop was, and I know what Taylor, Texas is. And then he talked about this guy that, a distant cousin, and then this guy and, that wrote the book, and I saw and I'm gonna get the book, because I wanna see the rest of that. But here's a white guy with a African name, you know good and well, no slave owner, uh, gave no slave, no, no African name, so somebody in that family, had to know that they had white people in the family, whether they owned them or not, to give them that name. And it went out, because you try to pick it up like, like it was Italian, but he know, he know, he told the story, I watched him do the whole thing. I said, whoa. And he went back, like he went all the way back. But my point is this, 
if we don't do our research, I like what he said, did he did his DNA? If you don't do the research and go for yourself, you will go for what mainstream tells you. And a lot of times it's going to be off. I went back as far as there was a guy by the name of, uh, did work on it called the Sushi Economics. He goes back to our present here over 100,000 years of black presence in what you call the Americas. Wasn't no America, it was called the New World. As I told you today, if you ask any question, when did the first European set foot on this continent? Most whites can't even tell you. It was Lee Philip the Red. He wound up in North America. When did the first red man show up in here? 15,000 years ago when he came through the power of space. But the Negro has been here 100,000 years before the, before the man ever showed up. On yeah. this what Bob is talking about is my cousin. His name is Joe Mozingo. And Joe theoretically was always taught that he was a white person. So his whole family had been in the United States for 400 some odd years, just theoretically believing they were white. One day he was walking and somebody came up to him, a black woman came up to him and said, wow, you've got a really interesting African name. And he's like, African, it's Italian. What are you talking, no, he did his research, found out that he was actually descendant of an African. And at some particular point along the family history, the black Mozingos and white Mozingos split off as family trees. So you have black Mozingos, white Mozingos, and, and that's where my DNA and, and my cousin is. And I appreciate that, because that, I, I saw that, and maybe I'll go get my DNA now, Doc. <laughs> yeah, the, the book is called The Fiddler on Pantico Run, and the author is Joe Mozingo. And, and, and he had a footnote in there about an African warrior with yes. white students. Yes. Yeah. Now, how do you think that happened? How do you think what happened? That this African warrior who came from Africa, came into Virginia, and wound up with white descendants. Well, from, from Joe's book, he clearly states it, right, that eventually somebody white married into the family, right? So... That's you know, with a family, it, it, it didn't raise your curiosity to dig a little further. Could it be Mike that Joe Mozingo might have got wealthy enough to own some white slaves? White well, no, he, he talks about it pretty thoroughly in the book, right? Oh. Where how, what happened that their family wasn't wealthy at all. The Mozingos well, are not wealthy, okay? But I mean, but but isn't it ironic that a white family wound up with an African name? Well, they, well, Joe admits he's not white. He says he he realizes yeah, that he's a black right. person. And, and, what? and he ain't the only one to pretend to be white that was black for many years. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I mean, they oh, just, come on now. one day somebody just decided we can't be black anymore because there's no profit in that. And we're going to be white. Right. You know, you, you know, it, it, imitation of life, the girl pretended she was white until, until she found out later. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, so that's well, now, well, well now, now you guys know where the term tall, dark, and handsome came from. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you hear me? What I have here that I want to share now is some letters from different uh, Union soldiers concerning the blacks that they saw fighting in the battlefield. Whether well, they got a month in and a month in out. But there is some records that shows it. And you can argue if you want to, but I'm going to share it. And you do your own research. Mom, will you read from this record? Yeah, starting right there. Okay, letter of Private Frank Bailey, 34th New York Infantry, mm -hmm. to his brother in Middleville, New York. Okay. West Point, Virginia, 12th of May, 1862. I hear that the rebels sent out a brigade of niggers, <laughs> a, a, a regiment of niggers to fight our men. Uh -huh. And they incited to all sorts of cruelty. It is said that they cut the throats of our wounded and then robbed them of every article of any value. The soldiers are death on nigger road. Mm -hmm. If they catch a nigger in the woods and there is no officer near, they hang them. Now, if the Southern chivalry, as they style themselves, put these niggers up to such deeds as this, may the curse of God light on them. That was a letter from a Union soldier about, about the Negro rebels fighting against the Union. Next letter. From Frank G. Bates, letter to his father, reprinted 
in the May 1st, 1863 Winchester Journal. Mm. The 13th Hoosier Regiment was involved in operations around the Suffolk, Virginia area in April through May 1863. Mm -hmm. I can assure you, Father, of a certainty that the rebels have a Negro soldiers in their army. One of their best sharpshooters and the boldest of them all here is a Negro. He dug himself a rifle pit last night, just across the river, and has been annoying our pickets opposite him very much today. A Negro rebel sharpshooter yes. in the Confederate court. Next letter. The Chicago Tribune cited by the Leavenworth, Kansas Daily Conservative, September 13, 1861. Says. Negroes are employed by the thousands in the rebel armies to fight against the Union. Oh, go ahead. Further from the same source, October 6, 1861. Chicago what? Tribune. Yeah, okay, so is, is that a legitimate paper, Shay? Sh yes, it is. Okay, well, now you can about must it out, but here's a legitimate letter from Chicago. Police. Said said that the Union, I mean, the Confederate had Negroes or niggers in there fighting. Now, I don't guess it's gonna lie. Proceed. Further from the same source, October 6, 1861, it is well known that Negroes and Indians serve in the rebel army. Mm. Upon the death of one Levi Miller in 1921, the obituary published in the Winchester Evening Star carried the title Levi Miller, Colored Wall Veteran, along with an account of his historic actions in the Wilderness Campaign, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Newcastle, Chambersburg, and other battles. Uh -huh. From the diary of James Miles, 185th New York Volunteer Infantry. From a young man's diary, read. Entry, entry, entry dated January 8th, 1865. Sarge said war is close to being over. Saw several Negroes fighting for those rebels. <laughs> Black Confederate Nick Wilkes. I was in every battle General Forrest ever fought. Now, who was General Forrest? General Forrest was a... Was a a general for the Confederate Army, he said these they was fighting under him. So, so I guess General Forrest was a was a Forrest too. Nathan Bedford Forrest was the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh well, well, well boy, you, you nailed it on the head. You nailed, come on with it. I was mustered out. At I have to interject, gentlemen. George Washington was the founder, but that's <laughs> another story. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. He said he was mustered out when? Wait a minute. Now he he was mustered out when? Oh, yeah. If you look in the top of the Capitol building, there's a painting of George Washington in the center circle. That's another line. <laughs> oh, well, back in the day, they didn't have to use sheets, man. Yeah, but no, no. Look here. Well, he, said he, he said that he was mustered. You said it wasn't no record. He said he was mustered out where, well, baby? At Danesville. Maybe. Yeah, show it to me. Go find the mustard roll and show it to me. He said he was. I this is a letter. $100 if you present it to me and show it to me. You won't well, find We got to pull that record up. Find it. I will come back on well, this you show. You know what? You I know will what? Come back uh, on this what? show and you know, eat barbecue. You can say you. all that if you want to, but the man didn't have to lie. And, and I wasn't there when he wrote. He had to lie, you know. So I'll, I'll take. Him yeah, there are, there are letters from Union soldiers who say that they saw black people because they never saw black people before, right? They, they, be kidding. they said that there were black people with tails oh, in their. Bro. So like we 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 come out on a spaceship and go back on a spaceship like you ever seen a black person. Come on, dog, don't play me like that, man. Come on. There there were literally people who were living oh, in the north, like the Northwest oh, Territory. Come on. You, you got more no sense than that with, with all with, with them degrees. You gotta have more sense than that. Come on, let's, let's don't do that. Let's let uh, do not play with my garden ass like that, bro. Don't do that. Come I mean, on, if, you, if you're literally thinking that there were no in the United look, States who never like saw black person, like then I don't know what to say to that. Like you, you know they didn't have television in those days, right? Well, look at what, what about uh, 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 there, 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 there no radio, there no television. They didn't, back, they didn't have them back in slavery either, but they know what a Negro looked like. Yeah, because there were slaves everywhere. Okay, well, the Confederacy in the look South. Out, yeah. Okay. Look out, look out, look out. Uh, okay, 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 gentlemen, punch and get out. All right, baby. Our soldiers by armed Negroes, a body of 700 Confederate Negro infantry, 
opened fire on our men, wounding two lieutenants and two privates. The wounded men testified positively that they were shot by Negroes and that not less than 700 were present armed with muskets. Mm. This is indeed a near feature in the wall. How much time we got left, uh, uh, Jermaine? Hey, King, y'all good. Do y'all think, man, this is an opportunity to learn okay. things as a younger generation. I love I love what you, you gentlemen are doing. And, um, keep going. Keep going. I keep going. Okay. All right. You done it? Okay. I have, we have heard of a regiment of Confederate Negroes at Manassas and another at Memphis and still another at New Orleans, but did not believe it till it came so near home and attacked our men. Mm. Ooh. 70 free blacks enlisted in the Confederate Army in Lynchburg, Virginia. 16 companies of free men of color marched through Augusta, Georgia on their way to fight in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Negroes in the Confederate Army, Journal of Negro History, Charles Wesley, Volume 4, Number 3, 1919, pages 244 through 245. She gave the date, name, address, and blood type. So you said don't exist, huh? That that's that's false too, huh, Doc? No, it's show me the mustard rolls. Well, I'm done, but I'm showing the mustard show. show. Now, we can talk to the mustard show, show and eat pork. How about some mayonnaise? Can I, can I give you some mayonnaise? Can I give you some mayonnaise for that? <laughs> you, you you said, mayonnaise? I'll, I'll eat some oh, barbecue. Come on, man. Come on. You bring me the mustard rolls. <laughs> like, can I bring you some mayonnaise? <laughs> okay. I'll even okay. throw in some chitlins, brother. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I ain't going with no chitlins, bro. <laughs> no, <laughs> you bring me the mustard rolls. Well, I, well, I'm gonna okay. bring you. I'm gonna bring you. I'm gonna bring you a little ketchup. And some okay, gentlemen. Oh, okay, 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 gentlemen. Okay, gentlemen. You got it. You got it. Hey, Rich, control your panel, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. I didn't even know. I didn't even know Jermaine was here. He's here. Okay, Jermaine. Come on, man. Oh. Read the last one. A burial marker. Wait a minute. This is a burial marker. At Confederate Mound. At Confederate Mound. Indianapolis, Indiana. And in Indianapolis, Indiana. Read. Read. Christian J. Negro, Company D. Morgan, Second, Ken, Calvary D. Calvary D. Didn't he? Okay. Vance J. W. Negro, CSA mail carrier D. Three fourteen sixty four. These are buried in the Confederate graveyard. Littleton Solomon Negro, mm. Third Missionary. Mississippi Infantry. You know, Mississippi, you know, if them niggas was fighting, they fought on Mississippi, they gotta be what? Mm -hmm. Confederate. Died 362. Come on. Mayo Henry, Negro. Mm. Company G36, Virginia Infantry. Virginia Infantry. Died 32362. <laughs> Hold on, come on, man. There were 20 other names. 20 other Negroes buried at the Confederate grave. Mark up and you caught by the mustard end, but let's go dig them up and check the DNA and see if they be black or not. <laughs> That's my case. We gotta quit telling these folks that that and you, and you gotta get these white folks off this illusion that there was no black folks involved in the Confederate and in the Union. We had people fighting on both sides. So Baba, um, I have a question for you. So basically what you're saying is Although there's books after books that have been copyright and sent out to the masses, you actually need to show up at these historical places like these museums where there's information that are not in these books to compare and contrast. Exactly. And you got to get out. And I'm like my boy, what's his name? Uh, David, what's his name that goes around all the time and doing the historical thing? Uh, what's the young man's name? Uh, King David, what's his name? Doing he historical did. things, yeah, he do a lot of historical things. He go and, and, and it, it does a lot of things on uh you on the YouTube, etc. But anyway, I had a chance to I traveled a lot of these things. I went as no 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 I did no he's a black brother and being a truck driver for fifty six years with six point five million miles log travel I was going visit these different places and I was thinking myself, you know what I should have done was like somebody should have got out there and and and, and what you call rub these things and just wrote them down, but you know, travel on that. I, but I kept hearing this thing, but black folks ain't just ain't that. And I knew good and damn well, excuse my French, that that's not true. 
And the reason I found out when I went on my tour for in Cobra for reparation, this what made me write the book, The Other Side of Slavery, The Untold Story, the collective works of things that I encountered, I see for myself, and people I talk to. You don't even have to go out. You can just search archives.gov. All of the Confederate muster rolls have been compiled. All of them. Look, uh, it's like going going to to archives.gov. If you just want to do internet. I got, I got, I got a question, question for both you guys. Apple, you can tell me about that, but I don't know until I taste it myself. I ain't got, you got to go taste it for yourself. That's hey, right. Hey, hey Gabriel. Yeah, you anything. Yeah. Yes, sir. I got a question. Yes, King. I got a yes, question sir. for you. I got a question for you, King. Yeah. Um, why is it that the so-called blacks weren't on the roll? Is it the same reason why they had other presidents before before George Washington that wasn't documented as well? Um, no, all the presidents before Washington were documented. There's not one that hasn't been documented. I don't know what I don't I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like you're asking me, do I beat my wife, right? I mean, I don't no, understand. No, 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 no. Don't no, don't no, don't no, don't no, take no, it. No. That's not what I'm asking you. Because we we have presidents that's no, you, not in you it. Not, no, 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 you, hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. We have yeah. presidents that's not in the history book. In the history books, it starts off with George Washington as the first president. So what I'm saying, like the brother had the brother asked a question. He says we have documents that says black enlisted in the confederacy right no you but don't how how they don't there's documents indicating that no, oh you're lacking it show me one. Different... Oh, come on doc show me one man could wait, 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 come wait, on, you, here, here's the thing here's the thing that in the united states that was really super important with militaries they knew that there was always a problem with one paying soldiers and to what happens when a soldier is deactivated out of the army, most people who are deacted look for some kind of recompense. So by the time we got to 1860s, we had already fought a series of wars from the American Revolution to the Seminole Wars, the War of 1812. America had so much blood on its hands before we even got to the Civil War. People fundamentally understood the importance of keeping adequate and good records, even in the Confederacy. Nah. So if you showed up, if you showed up where they were enrolling people into a Confederate unit, they would have taken your name. They would have done a number of things that would have listed you as a member of the Confederacy. We now, have to your life on it. You know, the problem. On it. problem. When I ask people to present to me, Give me one single document of one muster roll. The odds, if you're saying that all these black people, the odds of you presenting one would be good. The problem with it is, is that in 20 years, no one has been able to do that. That's well, the difference. It's, well, not that, it's not that people well, like myself, historians might, like myself will say, oh, there's never. The problem well, is you're well, saying yeah. stuff, yeah. but you have well, nothing to back it up with. You have well, a book. That was let written to me the primary sources. Let so me hear you know, work uh, with primary sources. Show me the document. I will, the document? I, will me I will eat pork if you show me one muster roll with a confirmed black person on it. Okay. So, have you ever tried to find the record? Have you ever tried to find the record? Yeah, I've, I've done research myself. No, yeah, you, 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 know, out, if you just want to be a warrior, warrior go to archives.com. No, no, no. I don't need archive.com. It's controlled. If you got in your vehicle and yes. actually drove oh, to the place yes. and went to the museum to find it, or went to the halls of records. I, I looked at, at Muslim, look, Confederate Muslim, and understand. you can't find it. There's none. I understand that we, we can't chew bubble gum and walk to, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to let that ride and let the folks do the research. I got one more piece of documents I'm going to share, and you can all go to the documents and say it ain't so. That's your call. But I got one thing you You'll see that black folks was in both sides, north and south. Is that correct? You, are you, are you so you're, saying, you're saying in both sides? I don't know what that means. What do you north, mean? North, in the north. Were there black soldiers in the northern army? Yes, and there were. We, we, have the 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 right. we have the northern yeah. army muster rolls to prove it. I'm not all I'm saying. Do you do you agree that we have blacks in the northern uh, army and the southern? Yeah, because we have muster rolls to prove it. I can in prove the southern, it. in the southern as well. The Confederacy, there are none, so I can't prove that. 
Well, then you ride that I'm horse. I'm just supposing because I'm gonna I'm, I'm, let you ride. I'm gonna let you ride that donkey. I'm but, just but I'm saying, because uh, I'm just a rational human being. I know that there were women who fought in the Confederacy, and there were women who fought in the North, and this was illegal for women to fight. So you got I know that I know so that there muscle, was, you got a muscle I rolled on women. I can extrapolate from that, and I can say, exactly. well, if there was a woman who fought in the Confederacy, then there has to have been at least one or two black people who were enlisted in the Confederacy. The problem with it is, is that none of them are on the muster rolls. But none is, of them. is she on the roll? Is she on the roll? Yes. The women are on the muster rolls, both okay, for the Confederacy right. and the North. You know, you yes, know there's that men are there too. But anyway, I'm going to leave it up with you. I'm going to make my last statement and I'm going to rest my case. Is that all right? Baby, the, the last doc thing that I'm, I'm sharing with them tonight. I don't, want, I don't want Doc eat, eat, eat no pork. I don't want to get his blood pressure up. <laughs> POW report. Wait a minute. POW report. And casualty list. And casualty list. When Where's it found at? Okay, you got it. Just read what you got there. When Fort Fisher fell to the Union troops in Fort January, Fisher. In January 1865, the following blacks are recorded by Union forces as being among the captured Confederates who were confined at Port Point Lookout, Maryland. Charles Dempsey, Private Company L, 36 North Carolina Regiment, 2nd North Carolina Artillery, Negro. Wait a minute. Can we go and Google this man's name and see if, see if, he, see if, if, if he was real or not, or, or was he fantasy? What, what's his name? Charles Dempsey. Charles Dempsey. D-E-M-P-S-E-Y, Private. That's private. Company F 36 North Carolina Regiment. Hey, Queens, help us out. Y'all do Google this, 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 see, because the brother may have a point. Charles Second North Carolina Artillery Negro. Okay. okay. Okay, my phone is breaking up. What was the name? Charles Dempsey. Spill the last name. Okay, one moment. D E M P S E Y, private. Company F. If we depend on Google, let's, let's see what Google say about this. 36 NC Regiment, 2nd North Carolina Artillery, Negro. Would this be under roster of soldiers? Could be. POW report and casualty list. Yeah, if you look up a colonel by the name of Michael Kelly, CSA, he was the 37th uh, Texas Cavalry Regiment, Terrell's Marauders, right? Uh, Charles Dempsey is listed, but the problem with it is oh, Dempsey. Oh, 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 oh. Hold your hold your point, but the Negro is what listed. You said it wasn't not on the muster roll. So yeah, you, show me the muster roll. Show it to me. I just man was in, they was in they was in there, bro. No, get the muster roll and show it to oh, me. Oh man, you know what? You are dancing and bobbing. No, I'm not. I'm asking you to provide me the primary yeah, source. Yeah. Will you read? Then you got ten dollars in your wallet and you want to buy something for me? Show it to me. Well, I got your money. money. You have in front of you. you bet you know about it. Show me your money. Was it was he in the was he in the Confederate? Show me the money. I got I'm asking you a question. You won't ask a question. I don't I, know that. You gotta show me the money. A lot of that with 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 our alleged scholars, you won't deal with the question. We, there, there, there was, I know for a fact that there was a Excuse I me. know for a fact that there was a Negro soldier by the name of Henry Mayo who was in the Army of the Confederacy in Virginia. I know that for a fact. Okay, stop. Please I, stop. I, Please stop. Thank you. Yeah, Please, I know. but like Please. I said before, Please there stop. were stop. Negroes stop. who did enlist, but were there dozens and dozens of Negro soldiers in the Confederacy? Stop. No, show me the muster roll. As a matter of fact, Henry Mayo is not even listed on the muster roll. You got pig feet coming your way, Doc. Hold up. Mayo's not even listed on the muster roll. Will you, will you please read what you got? Do you have anything? Because Doc don't, Doc don't want to do right. Henry Dempsey, Private Company L, 36 North Carolina Regiment, 2nd North Carolina Artillery, Negro. Continue. J. Doyle, Private Company E, 40th NC Regiment, 3rd North Carolina <laughs> Artillery, Negro. Oh. Daniel Herring. Daniel Herring Company F. Yeah, that's the same stuff I've gone through and talked with people for 40 years. And and and, and did, 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 
Do they exist? Not, not, not one single one of these people are on the muster rolls. And, they, and they, by the way, this comes from the venerable historian Charles Wesley, who, they, who wrote they, an article on this in the Journal of Negro History. Every, well, every these, historian knows this. Uh, hey, King, a doctor on a play ride, I asked him, did these Negroes exist or uh, uh, these are fabrications? Yeah, no, these are these these people. Charles, like I said, Charles H. Wesley, who is a venerable black historian, wrote this article. I've read it before. Okay, the problem cool. with it is, that when, you, the problem that. is that when you Based take on. names and you search them for the Confederate muster rolls, they don't they're, they're not there. The cause of that don't mean they didn't exist. So you go to the Mississippi Confederate muster rolls and you look at for Solomon Littleton, you won't find him. We know that he that someone wrote the name Solomon Littleton. We know that, but he's not on the muster roll because oh, Charles you know Wesley. What? Well, muster roll, a uh, 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 man's rolls. Uh, uh, How uh, can you be in the uh, third infantry sure, and not be sure. listed in the muster roll when the third That's infantry has the muster roll? Uh, to the, to our host and to our. Uh, I got a question oh. for you guys. I got a question for you guys. Like you guys are talking over each other. Quick question. Yeah, right? yeah, and, 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 and that's not professional. And, and I apologize. Yeah. But, no, no. but the it's brother, fine. Well, y'all passionate. Y'all passionate. Yeah, you guys are yeah. both, both profound individuals that do y'all um on research. He's a teacher and so on and so forth. And we both here to learn. Um, I got a question for you, King. Um, which one? Um, Mr. Selassie. Um, how? As a youngster, how would I get a hold of these mustard rolls to check the information myself, if you don't mind? If you, if you just want to do just some quick, basic research, the best place to look is the National Archives, because the National Archives have had compiled all the mustard rolls, right? Because that's what they do. They're there to, to collect all the American history. The easiest thing to do, I can, I can put a directory of, uh, or or the um, website that you can actually go to nationalarchives.gov, archives.gov, and you can search for it yourself. I can list it up. I can't put it in the live comments, but I can put it here um, in the uh, in our section, and you can just look for yourself. Civil okay. War, basic research, nation, national archives. I, I got a question too because um, I have another brother in here that that preaches. Um, the explain is the explanation is not the explained and question everything. And based on these people's reputation, especially as a youngster come up in school, I know they fabricate every single thing to make themselves look important, to make they seem like they're the dominant race. But there is there's facts that's listed among us, such as blacks creating a multitude of things like even in society today like take the stoplight and the cell phone and a whole bunch of stuff like that but when you when you search for these things it's not something that just pops up to you there's a lot of deception out there and the books that we utilize in school didn't have these information you get what i'm saying so if if we're not digging beyond what we have learned we will never get these information and especially if we don't talk to our elders such as you guys we won't get these information yeah the the, the one thing that that i learned as a historian as a graduate student and in graduate school they force you to look beyond the surface right because it's like what marx karl marx said that if everything was as it is on its surface there'd be no need for microscopes Right. So you have to go beyond the surface. The, the one thing that separates just stuff that's out in the ether and real history is the sources. Right. Historians primarily work with primary sources, and those are the original documents. Our next thing to do is to work with the secondary sources, and those are books that are written using the primary sources as a backup. Right. Because mm -hmm. There are always varying viewpoints. The problem with, with, with Civil War history is this, and, and this is where I think we're, where we can really understand this. After the Civil War, there was a lot of talk in the South about the, the absolute destruction that the South incurred because of the Civil War. I, I know that you guys probably are familiar with Sherman's March to the Sea, right? And uh, the Shenandoah campaign, where the South was just literally obliterated. And this is one of the real untold stories. Southerners know this story because it happened to them. 
where Sherman and his soldiers, a lot of them black soldiers, literally ran through the South, raped, pillaged, and plundered and destroyed the Southern infrastructure. After the Civil War, Southern historians began to question why we fought this war. And, and they had one thing that no other American had, and that was the fact that they, in fact, were the only Americans that had ever lost the war until Vietnam. So what Southern historians began to do in earnest, and Woodrow Wilson, our venerable president in World War I, he was a historian. They began to rewrite the Southern narrative. We call it the narrative of the lost cause. And what this narrative was about was rewriting the history of why the, United, why the South fought the Civil War. One, it wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. Two, Black people were happy being slaves. We treated them exceedingly well. Two, black people fought. Well, that's more about Eskimo, huh? So, so what I'm explaining to you here is, is that there was a whole branch of history, Southern history, that was dedicated to showing that whites in the South were not racist, that slavery was something that they didn't want, but inherited from their fathers, they treated slaves benevolently, so benevolently that they allowed them to enlist in the Southern army and they fought along with us because Southern black people hated Northern white people. And if it wasn't for those damn Yankees, everything would have been fine. Yeah, right. We didn't start rewriting the history and looking at this lost cause narrative until the 1960s when historians began to question the Southern narrative. The greatest myth that still exists today. And it's the one that my friend Kevin Levin, who's been looking at this for years, has, has is this myth that the black people fought in the Confederacy. Read Levin's book. You can send me an email and you can challenge. You can even send Levin a, a, a emails and you can challenge him on his facts. But the facts remains, there were no wholesale black people fighting in the Confederacy, just there just weren't. Now, we can quibble here about, oh, well, you know, we didn't get all the history. Yeah, of course we did, and white people are not gonna allow you to challenge the power structures in America. And if they can keep black people as ignorant as possible, they're going to do that. The only way to keep yourself from being ignorant is you gotta get the primary sources, man. You got to dig in those primary sources. And then be honest with yourself when you find something that you don't agree with, accept it as what it is, and don't try to change the narrative. Absolutely, brother. I'm a historian. I'm always you know, you, you, rewriting you, everything. You, you've said that about 80 times already. We got that. But all I'm saying, and I don't claim you don't hear stuff, I'm just a little ignorant black man that went out there and did the research and came back with some information that a lot of folks can't not digest and want to say it ain't right. Oh, so Wait, 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 please, please, please. Now, I asked you a while ago, and you said that I'm not, that you're older than I am. How old are you? I'm into my 60s, brother. Well, I'm 74. Okay, so, and. Okay. I, I, 1946, I'm 74. Mm-hmm. Right. I passed it 48 years, so while you were not even here yet, I was already here. Yeah, I started studying. Wait, 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 I started wait, wait. studying the Civil War in 1970. Well, guess what I was doing in 1970? You were studying the Civil War. I was studying a whole lot of stuff, and in, 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 in school and everywhere else, because I was traveling as a as a truck driver. And I've seen a lot of things that's not in books. Oh, of course, uh, a whole lot of things that are not in books. So, so you know, so uh, we we can play this finesse game all we want to. But I, all I'm saying to the people, you heard Doc and I talk. I love the brother. In fact, go do your own personal research. Don't believe nothing you want to just say. Do your own research. Oh, you you got to do your own research. research. Wait, wait, wait. I'm telling the people out there that don't know either one of us. Do your research. Take the information we both put out there and come with your own deductive reasoning about what took place. Yeah, you got to oh. do your, Baba is right. You got to do your own research. Hit anybody can hit me up. You find that Confederate muster roll. I'll eat some bar. I'll eat some pig's feet. Well, I ain't. I'm looking at you. Ain't got to get you get the muster roll. But I'm telling you, right? You, I'm on Twitter. 
I'm, uh -huh. You can Google me. You can shoot me that Confederate muster roll. Okay. The man wants some mustard. You might put, might put, put a little, little barbecue sauce with it because he got to eat that pig feet. But anyway, well, uh, <laughs> I'm going by the burial records where they say they buried that, whether it was mustard in or jacked in or busted out. Because when I got it, we, we busted out the airport. Wasn't where they mustard. We, so we busted out. But anyway, I fairly enjoyed myself. If there are any questions, if, if there's any doubt, uh, my book is called The Other Side of Slave, The Untold Story. You can get it. You can pass the information documents and see if it lines up, if it's on point or not. Uh, my name is Baba Yashubaya. My book is written under the name Kohane Yashubaya. And my number is 318-341-2160. And I'm on Facebook and all over the place. And I will sit down with anybody, be it political, religious, or what we just talked about tonight, and have a discussion. Gabriel, you have anything you want to say to the people? No, you can Google my name, Gabriel Selassie. I'm at LA right. City College. You can find my email. You can shoot me anytime. Anybody I want to shoot, want to shoot you, bro? I want to contact you? You, you, you can, you can, <laughs> hit me. It, it's not a problem. I thoroughly have still enjoyed it, though. It's, it's been beautiful. Learned a hey. lot, learned a lot. Hey, guys, guys, Rich, um, Shanae, Ms. Spiche, do you guys have anything y'all want to add or questions y'all want to ask these brothers? No, I want to thank the brothers for showing up. Uh, we need more of uh, historians on because history is a very popular thing these days. It, I'm sure it's always been popular to um, Gabriel and, and Baba. And, uh, you know, we welcome you at this platform. But, you know, I, I always I have a show on Sundays called Beyond the Surface that's based on my book. Right. Uh, Beyond Thought, Living Without Hurt and Depression. Uh, and beyond the surface is what needs to be done. And I think, and I, I don't think I see that history, that's what that is going by beyond the surface. I mean, but it's still his story, wherever it's you're cool, reading right. it, you know, it's still their story. I mean, it has merit, it has its place, but in my book, I state that um, just because something wasn't written or documented doesn't mean it didn't happen. My point exactly. Queens. Uh, I, I I have something. I'm actually looking at the National Archives catalog, and I, I see a statement here, and I just want to kind of uh, read this. It says, "No roll call was reported just before a unit entered battle." All as noted above, there are a variety of reasons why particular individuals may not have been present at that time. Different companies in the regiment may have had different assignments, or an individual soldier may not have been absent exertion to their assignment, other duties, or other causes. Muster roll, which were ordinarily compiled to cover a two-month period, are generally accurate for the day on which the roll was filled out, but often not for all of the period covered. If a person left the ranks sometime during those two months and then returned, the absent may not show on the roll. This is especially true for Confederate roles. So I just want yeah. to kind of drop that information since I'm on the National Archive. Yeah, Muscle and, roll, and what you're uh, talking about is that on the day of the battle, they would take a roll call and they needed to separate out those people who were either deserters or people who were in hospital units but every person that joined the Confederate Army is listed on a Confederate muster roll, even if they ended up dying, deserting, what have you. Well, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but that's not what this is saying. No, that is, that, that is, government you're, you're not understanding it. I, fought in, I was in the Army. I know what they're talking about. So I got a question. Well, I'm on the website that you, you take sent out. Yeah, guys, guys. So I got a question. I, I pay attention strictly. So why were they saying it would only last for two months? Yeah, because the, the the battle space changes. You might have people who signed up in 1861, and by 1863 they were dead, and so then the the unit itself might have lost 50 percent of its soldiers. So if you looked at the Confederate muster roll at the day that everybody enlisted in 1861, it wouldn't be reflective of 1862. Right. 
So so wouldn't that be a contradiction pertaining to the information that's not within these musters, bro? Like if No, if, so if a if a black person showed up in 1862 and said, I want to enlist, they would list them in 1862. So either way, either at the beginning, the middle, or the end, your name would show up on a Confederate. Okay, copy. Hey, Rich, you have anything you want to add? Shanae, you have anything you want to add? You've been real quiet. Shanae, you have anything ahead, you want to add? I well, I was, I was also looking over the muster roll system, and it states that it's, um, it's a roll that's kept daily um, after a payment is made, and it's kept as a voucher daily. So if it's kept as a voucher to prove payment, I'm, I'm just assuming payment for the soldier and it's kept daily, then I, I didn't come across the two months. But if it's kept daily, I, I would I would I would believe that that could, you know, if someone didn't want to take count for someone who was there because they didn't want to pay for them, then it's easy to just do away with the voucher. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, voucher, well, if it's, the voucher could be thrown away, but the muster roll would not be thrown away. And think about the this. The muster roll For is kept years. as a voucher. What and it says about, here is the muster roll is kept as a voucher. And a voucher is a receipt for payment. So if, if I didn't want to show that I paid for somebody, I would just throw the roll away for that day. Yeah, but why would you do that? Why not? <laughs> why would they? Why why they not? But that's not know. answering the question. If I am a paymaster and I need to pay people, I would throw all my stuff away. Why would they say Christopher Columbus discovered America when there's blacks thousands of years before he came here? And there was a Viking that, that came here before him. Yeah, but that's that that's it's, it, that's, like, that's like saying nobody landed on the moon. I mean, yeah, you can make that hypothetical question, but it's not grounded in anything. It's not, a, it's not, a hypothe it's not hypothetical. It's pretty so you're, much so What you're set. trying to tell me is, is that all these Confederate King. paymasters are just throwing away their muster rolls. King, King, King. No, King. What, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen, I'm, I pay very close attention to things, right? We're celebrating a man that never discovered anything. He's a mercenary. Is that documented? Oh, absolutely. But what is this? Who was his? Who was his? Who was his? Who was his navigator? What I'm. What I have to prove with the mustard roll is, especially with dealing with white people, right? Uh -huh. They tend to switch things to make it look like they're dominant than who they actually are. But you're not understanding. You don't understand this. What is that to understand? Because white people are claiming that black people were in the Confederate army. They're how not many, How many of them are saying that? What's the percentage? Oh my gosh, this is the number one myth of the South. What this myth? is an essential fundamental argument that white people make about the Confederacy. This is not some side argument. This is their whole basis of slaves were happy. They loved being slaves. And not only that, I, they fought alongside of us in the Confederacy. I heard the you say that. That they can prove that mm -hmm. black people were in the Confederacy is that they have to document the fact that here's private black something that was in the Confederacy. Okay. Why would a Confederate paymaster then say, yeah, we had all these black people fighting for us and they loved us, but we're going to throw all the documents away. We ain't gonna pay him. We're not King, gonna pay him. King, King, uh, you, you, I heard you said blacks love being slaves earlier, and no, that's what Confederates say. That's oh, okay. their argument. Okay, that was their argument. Okay, that is their argument. Not was their argument. That argument is fundamental to the entire lost cause narrative. That, that's why I'm saying that's the problem with it. If black, if they, if if this idea of black Confederates is so important, which it is. And I just urge you to look up the lost cause narrative. Then why you, why would they be throwing this stuff away? It just it just it, if, they ain't gonna, if they don't respect, they ain't gonna pay them. Why why not throw it away? What color why is the you, person that wrote the narrative? Yeah, I, I don't know what narrative. The lost cause. Oh. Yeah, the lost cause narratives are white people. Oh, okay. That's the whole point. Yeah, they would not uh, yeah. uh, redact the name. Point, point taken. 
I don't I don't see color by the way, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you don't I if you don't it here. <laughs> Well, you know, in my in my book I state, look at the action. Right. You know, don't let your perception be managed. We I think we all can agree on, and I state this in my book, that whatever you read or whenever you go back to history when you actually wasn't there is secondhand information. Mm -hmm. And um, my show Sunday about organized religion is going to have a lot to do with that because, you know, I'm saying where's the proof of Moses and all these other things. I see the pyramids in that, but um, when you're not actually there, I mean, I've been to, I lived in a lot of cities. I've been to Atlanta, New York. I can tell you if, you, if you're standing on 34th Street and, or wherever you are, uh, what's, what's, what went on, but I can't tell you what's going on now. Mm -hmm. I can, uh, what, I'm, what, I'm trying, what I'm saying, uh, panel, is no matter how accurate somebody's story is, they can't tell you what they missed. And uh, if you're not there, Whatever you're reading is secondhand. And not to, not to say that Baba and Gabriel is not on point at all. It's just we have to understand that there is a blind side. Definitely. Um, oh, yeah. History, history is full of blind spots, brothers and sisters. It is. And it is always going to be incomplete, and it's always going to be biased. There's just no way to get around that. Like so what we try to do to avoid some of those blind spots and biases is we work with primary sources. It's just the and only way. That can also, right? And they can be biased also, right? Primary source, because the writer can be biased. Everything can be biased, but then when you say that, when you get to the point where you say everything is biased, then you can't write any narrative. You're stuck. Okay, well, that's one of the things. In fact, I write my book with the thing of being biased. So then your book is biased. Your book is my, my book is not biased. My book is not biased. You got to read it. It's not biased. Yeah, so the other down, down the middle. Is, but yours is not. Yeah, well, my, well I tell you what, you get and read, you see it they're down the middle. I leave nothing unturned. Yeah, that's why I'm saying I think your book is on point. I'm, that's why I'm suggesting that with history, the problem with it is, is that you can get yourself caught up in the idea that other people's stuff is biased. But you then have to turn around and say, then if theirs can be biased, then what am I? Can't my work be just as biased as theirs? And you, and if you claim that it's not, well, then you know you've just erected a straw man. You've built a statue with clay feet. Right. Right. You have to acknowledge like, your own particular biases I in like your it. own oh, work, okay. and you have to be working from primary sources as a means to root out as much biases as you can. It's not always going to be perfect, and it's like not going to be bias-free, but you're going to try your best to root it out. Hey, Doc, primary Doc. sources, if you show me the primary sources, I agree with you. Yeah. Hey, Doc, what, what, um, what are you, what, what's, what's your reference pertaining to primary sources? You, what any, you, you said primary sources. Um, yeah, what, do you mean, what, what is my reference? You say, you say you're a historian, right? Can you yeah. give us... Can you give us yeah, I have a sources? I have a PhD in history. Can you give oh. us some? Can you give us some primary sources? Uh, yes, the, the one that we've been talking about right now, the Civil War muster rolls. Those are primary sources. A diary is a civil as a primary source. So what a historian will do is this: historians will look at, grab the primary sources, and say, "Okay, here's a primary source, and this is, let's say, a Confederate muster roll, just hypothetically." Then he will see a name on the muster roll and you'd say, OK, well, it's on here. But who is Charles Smith? I don't know, have any idea who Charles Smith is. So he enlisted in, let's say, Natchez, Mississippi. So what you're going to do then is you're going to go to Natchez, Mississippi, and you're going to try to find that person who's Charles Smith. Right. If you can find a tax that the person paid, find where that person lived. You can say, well, OK, according to the muster roll, the person enlisted in the army, I found the person's recorded birth in the uh, county seat. And you can start extrapolating and connecting dots. That's what historians do. We try to connect dots to place so, the people in the proper spot at the proper time, the proper dates. Let so, me ask you a question, uh, Mr. Gabe, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Gabriel. 
wasn't black people considered property and and was it and was the jackass and the mule with with, with, with on the muster roll um black people who were enslaved were considered property and so, so, that, so that so they would that make them be on the muster roll because wasn't the jackass and the and the wagon they pulled it when they wouldn't they be on the muster roll no they would not but they still property yes okay I, I'm not sure where you're going with that. A black know, person who's a slave is property. That's all right. They know why I went with it. Can you someone explain that? that? You're not listing those. They are considered property, so you're not listing them as individuals on the muster roll. So that you need to list your jackass and the tools that you use on the muster roll. They're not there because they're not recognized as yeah, sure, sure, people. sure. Okay. So but here, then here's the problem that you have. Here's the problem. If you are a black person and you're a slave, and you're considered property, you couldn't have been put on the muster roll, right? You just, you, right? That That's just the fact because you're not a private individual who has your own rat, uh, um, ability. That was, that, was my hypothetical. that was my hypothetical, okay? So, so then they were slaves. So then they were slaves. So how many of them were there? Well, who I mean, were there? Well, 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 all if I they're not on the muster roll and if they're slaves, how do you know that they even fought? You can't, you can't, how are you gonna do that? Well, all I go by with the guys that they saw was shooting at them, that's all I know. Um, I had a question, why is the muster roll breaking up into three parts? <laughs> Uh-oh. Why is a muster roll break, broken up? Can you go into there's, a little bit there's, more there's a, there's a There's a Normandy roll, there's a, re, there's a registry of areas of wages due to work people. There's details of measurement of work done by laborers. There's, yeah. three, there's, three, there's three parts. There's three parts to the muster roll. So the muster roll, in actuality, looking at it from the definition, it wasn't actually kept as official records, sir. Yeah, they I'm, were. I'm looking at it right now. I, I don't understand the nature of your question. There are there are muster uh -oh. rolls for soldiers who enlisted in the military. Uh -oh. But 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 Queen read it earlier, indicating that the muster roll is a is a vulture of uh -oh. muster roll is not a voucher. So why well, do they have it listed as a vulture of payment and and the soldiers being present? Because because when 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 you're a paymaster for the army, you have the number of soldiers that you've got to pay. You can't just take the money and stick it in your pocket. You've got to demonstrate to people that that money was paid out to according to the numbers of people that are standing and living right now able to accept that money. And that has to be documented. Okay, so if my brothers and sisters, two in the Navy, one in the Army, right? If they're present today, they'll be on the mustard roll. But come a couple years, if something may happen to them, would they still be on that mustard roll? Yes, they would. Okay. You can't enlist in the, if you enlisted in the Army, your name would be on a mustard roll somewhere. You just said there was probably wouldn't be on the mustard roll. If you are a free black person, who enlisted in the army? Your name would be on. Now you saying free black? I said slave. Okay, so then there was a slave. If a slave is property, they would not have been listed on the muster roll. So then you're trapped. Then you. Thank you. Checkmate. Checkmate. You're the only hypothetical. How many of them were there? What were their names? Well, I mean, hey, come on. All we say they were there. All we say they were there. All we say they were there. You say they wasn't there, but what? But one. No, I'm asking you a question. Name me a slave who was there. That is on your answer. You said they wouldn't be on the muscle road, and I said checkmate because that's the problem. That is the inherent problem with this kind of stuff when you're dealing with it, and so. What historians try to do, that's why the primary sources are important. Now, fair work. If you read Kevin Levin's book, he tell you that, yeah, they were dragged last in the first to I'm fight in the I don't know Kevin. Not a problem. Nobody is going to acknowledge that that didn't happen. But were there I'm Confederate, not, talking to Kevin. Confederate I'm Army? Not, excuse me. No. Hey, guys, guys, you, guys, 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 let each other speak. Uh, we can hear the audience can hear it clearly. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm talking on my, my computer, and sometimes it I can't tell if another person, so. Oh, oh you're fine. You're fine. You're fine, Kevin. I'll rest. I, I'm resting. I didn't got any, any more questions. I'm resting. Okay, so let me, let me see if I can, to, to, to distill this out, to see if I can make it make more sense. You're going to argue to me that, OK, a Confederate brought their slave to fight in in uh, the Confederacy. Yeah. OK. So you tell a slave, pick up this rifle and shoot it at those white people over there. 
yeah, not a problem. Which, why would I argue with that? Because I would imagine if the slave said, hell no, I'm not gonna shoot at those people, they probably might've been killed, stabbed or what have you. I grant you that, but what's your point? Your point is, well, there were black people over there. <laughs> Where is where is the dialogue in that? That there's no dialogue in that. What, what what lost cause narrative is this? The lost cause narrative is not arguing that white people brought their slaves into battle. That's not what they're arguing. The lost cause narrative is is that black slaves were so happy to be slaves that they enlisted in the Confederate Army. And why they make the distinction between those who enlisted and those slaves who were just brought to the battlefield is a of agency. I have it's a different for a black slave to say, I love white people so much that I'm going to sign up and die for you is a whole lot different than you pointing a gun at your slave and say, kill those white people or else. I That's have a, a major distinction. I have a question. One of you queens, look up William April Ellis and read his narrative, how he supported and bought Confederate bonds to support the Confederate army and being a slave owner. Don't say nothing, Doc. I want one of the young ladies to pull up William April Ellis. Ellis, I Ellis. Have to because it's not wait, Ellis. Wait, 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 Ellis. Son. I, I, I asked you a question. I asked, no, I know. It's Ellis' son, not Ellis. Well, Ellis' son. Well, yeah. Ellis' son, April. William April Ellison, and pull him up, and let's read his narrative, and let's see why he support and bought Confederate war bonds to support the Confederate if black folks was happy being with the Confederate. One of you beautiful queens, pull that up for me and read that. It just came All to right. me. It just came to All me. right, Bob, I got it. All right. On March 26, 1857, William Ellison wrote to his son, Henry Ellison, about the family business. Life was going well and Ellison wanted to update his son on how things were going at home. John, one of Ellison's 53 slaves, had just been to the river to collect payment from a number of white slave owners for the cotton gins they had purchased from Mr. Ellison. He came back with no money at the end of the day though. Ellison's customers had made had either made excuses such as wanting to consult their overseer before paying or had not been where they said they would be. There was no frustration in Ellison's tone as though this was something that he has had to deal with before. He then gave instructions to his son to purchase a number of farming tools that would inevitably be used in the fields by his slaves. He gave a brief farewell and ended the letter. This same type of letter may have been sent a thousand times from a slaveholding father to his slaveholding son in mid 19th century American South. But William Ellison and his son, Henry Ellison were different. William Ellison was an African-American born into slavery in April of 1790 with the name April Ellison to a slave mother and white slave master father, Mr. William Ellison. As a young man, he was apprenticed to a cotton gin maker rather than working in the fields and allowed, the, and allowed to keep a portion of the wages he earned for his master and his father. Money that he later used to purchase his freedom. At the same time, he changed his name William, to William Ellison after his father to fit, to fit into higher society. After purchasing his family, he moved to Sumter County, South Carolina, and hired out other free African-Americans to work in his cotton gin shop. While working, he discovered a common problem among free slaves in the South. The expense of wages left him with a profit that would neither compete with the slave owners or earnings. Wanting to move up in society, he purchased his first slaves in 1820. By 1850, Ellison had 37 slaves while his sons owned another 16. He was one of about 180 black slave masters in South Carolina at the time, most of whom were former, former slaves themselves. Like Ellison, they realized that the only way to get out of the lower middle class that so many free slaves, free blacks were stuck in was slave labor. With nearly 9,000 free blacks in South Carolina, 
the eight, the 180 made up a tiny percentage who were willing to do anything to compete with the upper class white slave owners at the time. Just because he owned slaves though, did not mean they were treated equally among slave owners. As Ellison subtly hints in his letter, white slave owners would avoid interacting with African-Americans as much as possible. Ellison provided many whites in the area with what were the best cotton gins available, which meant that if they wanted to produce the most cotton, they would have to do business with them. They would often try to avoid paying, paying him though. Despite the discrimination, blacks owning blacks continued all the way up to the Civil War with many African-American slave owners, including Ellison, contributing and supporting the Confederate side. You know what's Stories interesting about wait, 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 let finish, let I'm finish. not finished. Stories let like Ellison. How long is this going to be? Let, let, we got let, let me let finish. finish. Let me finish. Uh, Stories like Ellison's and other black slave owners showed the economic power of slavery in Southern America in the 19th century. The easiest way to achieve financial and social success was to own slaves and the allure of Southern wealth was enough that it convinced a few slaveries, former victims to switch to the other side. That's it, Baba. Okay, here's the interesting thing about Ellis' son that I, that I know. Ellison had two sons. Ellison at the time of the Civil War was about 70 years old, so he was way too old to fight. His sons- his sons were probably about 55, maybe six, may, maybe about 55, 50, may or may not have, they've been at the edge of being able to fight. But Ellison had a grandson who was at the age where he could have fought for the Confederacy. Guess what happened? Ellison's son did in fact, we think, fight for the Confederacy. He never was allowed to enlist. They allowed that we think, we're not sure, we think that he may have carried a weapon. We're not quite sure, but he was never allowed to enlist in the regular Confederate army. He wouldn't do it because he was black. My point was that he, that April Ella's son supported the Confederate through oh, one of and his finance. All I'm saying is that him and other blacks in the South supported the, the, the Confederate with their monies and their support. And their oh, a lot of black people did. Confederate war bonds. A lot of black people correct? did. Am I a lot correct? Of black people did. Like Ellison, a lot of black people supported the Confederacy. But none of them were allowed to enlist in the Confederate Army, just like Ellison's grandson. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, that was my discussion. I'm saying that you had people yeah. like him that bought war bonds to, to support the Confederate against the Union. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. I have no qualms with that. That's, 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 made. that's fine. Yeah, and Ellison Branson tried to enlist and he was barred because he was black. We ain't talking about trying to enlist. I'm talking about the man supporting a call. You claim that we, we that the man, man, there were black people in South Carolina who supported segregation. Candace Owens is a real I, person. Da, da, da. Come on. That's your thing. Was, da, my point was made that Ellison and others supported the Confederate. My point making a lot of black folks got this thing about it was all about white folks and black folk weren't involved. I'm trying to show my people we had other people of color involved in the financing of the Confederate war against the Union, against the North. Absolutely. That's I, I That's agree with you, Bob. So quit saying that we didn't have no part when we had a financial part. I, I don't know what you're saying. Part. You must I, not be listening. I'm agreeing with you. I agree with you. Honey. Yeah, yeah, I'm, one thing I do, I listen and I hear. Trust me. And, but, uh, and like I said, you can't explain the fact that Ellison's grandson tried to enlist and was barred because he was black. I, I didn't bring that up. I no. did. I didn't bring my point was about the money. My thing was about the money. Like I said, there were black people who supported the Confederacy. There were black people who supported segregation. And <laughs> hands up. <laughs> I mean, we all got black saying, people in the All I was saying, Doc, and I appreciate all I was saying is that a my lot last of people, question, lot, my last okay. question before we close this the show. My all question right. is, as a youngster, I want to know why would a black man, right, participate or fund? Yes. Fund. Yes. Right? 
Yes. That fight. Yes. Why? Why would he fund the fight? I, you can you I can't be in that person's shoes, so I don't know what's going on and psychologically, but I can just say just thinking about it, what could be some of the rationale for it? One is just pure economics. Uh, there were substantial black people in the South, particularly in Louisiana, who uh, were making a lot of money off of owning slaves, and they didn't uh, want their way of life to be compromised. There yeah. also could have been a component of just, um, you guys have heard of the Stockholm Syndrome, haven't you? Yeah, yeah you, there could have been just black people who, and, and we know this from Louisiana, um, El, um, um, what's Wynton Marcellus' brother? Uh, Branford Marcellus talks about this quite a right. bit. He talked because he's from Louisiana. He talks about the idea that in Louisiana, you have lots of black people who had married into French culture and they didn't consider themselves to be black people. They considered themselves to be Creoles of color, gens de couleur. They considered themselves to be better than black people and better than white people. We, we got the caste system going on now. But my point was to my people. If the thing was so terrible, why would another black fat, a black person support the Confederate if it's all about freeing the niggas from slavery? Why would another, my point, why would why would they do that? And why would another black enslaved go and become a slave master if it was all about freeing the slave? And you and I know both. It was not I about slavery, it. it was about economics. We both yeah, know that. It's right? about economics, it's money. Yeah, but I, the narrative, but the narrative is out among our people that white folks fought to free the Negroes, and that's a lie. Guys, I want to say gratitude on actually showing up. It is a very profound show. Um, thank you for your energy. The lessons were well learned. And for those that participate on the outside watching the show, I say um, don't take what these brothers indicate at face value. Go ahead and do your research, research. and dig it for yourself um, and pass it forth to your children and so on and so forth. Gabriel. Homage 100% for taking the time out of your day to actually grace us with your present. Um, if you feel like joining us in the future, you can do so more than freely. Um, Baba, thank you for all that you continue to do and your teachings and so on and so forth. We welcome you guys once more. Um, Shanae and Prashe, gratitude. Rich, um, I want to say thank you, brother. I know your show is coming up tomorrow. For those of you that would like to participate in our weekly lives and discussions, please send me a friend request at King Jermaine on Facebook. Go ahead and follow on IG and Twitter at Mental Roller Deck. On YouTube, like and subscribe at Mental Roller Deck. And with that being stated, I say gratitude, love, elevation, and prosperity to everyone. Peace. Mo Thank Dupre. you. Thank you. Mo Many Dupre. blessings. Glad to talk with you all. Yeah, beautiful. All right.